Hello and good morning and welcome to the second day of our Applied AI conference on Applied AI in Agritech. We connect domain knowledge in AI with uh, farming, agriculture, agriculture machinery, soil observation and everything beyond. Clemens, what do we have yeah. planned for the second day of our Speak, speak, speaking of beyond, this is actually the, the, the perfect intro. Yesterday, we saw lots of, let's say, uh, image-based analytics or time series-based analytics, like where to spray, how much to spray, or even how to deploy capital. Uh, today, there's uh, a very large portion of the program dedicated to robots. So being fa be it farming robots in the air, on the ground, on the soil, and so on. So you can also see this in the in the agenda on my right hand side uh, so starting from half past 10 uh, we look at the small uh, small robot company and from there on we have uh, five talks in that area uh, yeah as as usual if you want to get in touch with the speakers just uh, write them over b 2 match or, or hit them on linkedin uh, when it comes to the conference page itself we made some adaptations to yesterday because uh by popular demand and we, we also witnessed how you were using the the integrated slido uh we decided that uh, instead of showing the slido module where you can ask the speakers questions all the time we show you the a, a chat window on the right hand side and yeah perhaps matthias is giving you a very brief rundown yeah, where, where to find the you... chat window Give you a short rundown. Um, this is the conference page. And as you know, you probably watch right now in the live stage area. And uh, we have here a chat window. And to join, you have to click join the discussion, after which you can send messages to everyone. And uh, should you still be interested in uh, joining the question and answer session on Slido, we will post the link into this chat immediately so you can vote and uh, ask uh, more special questions yourself. Also, don't forget the B2B meetings are ongoing. Please always be on time and check out our wide range of different participants from all over the world and the marketplace of products they are offering. Uh, this is one of the largest conferences on this topic that at least I have seen in the last couple of months. And uh, I invite you dearly to use the opportunity to uh, invite interesting people to talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. Don't take it from me, take it from them. And with that, I wish you uh, successful meetings and an interesting conference. And Clemens, should we get our partners on stage? Yes, of course. You know, this, this, the same procedure is everywhere, every, every year, Matthias. So let's see. Hello. We welcome Hello, with good, us. Morning. good morning. Good morning. Berger Thank from you, Digital Innovation Hub Innovate and Johannes Müller from Tech House. Hi, good morning. So today, second day, uh, perhaps to tell us some words about how the workshops went yesterday, because I mean, for online workshops, the the registration numbers were quite extreme in the three digits. Yes. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe do you want to expand on the uh, workshop um, from the Digital Innovation Hub? Yeah, um, it was quite nice to also interact with, with people during the workshop to not just give this like frontal speech to everyone, but to get some some feedback directly, see somebody, some one of us, all of you also with like camera and everything. So we got in touch with, with two interesting, similar digital innovation hubs and initiatives in Europe. So that was um, very great to to make those connections and to also have a, a good talk. Um, anybody who, who missed it, who missed the workshop, please feel free to reach out to me. I, I'll make a small mini, mini workshop for you if you're interested in getting to know the Digital Innovation Hub Innovate. Excellent. And yeah, same as yesterday, uh, we will alternate the moderations throughout the day. So don't worry, we, we won't be gone or yeah. Don't feel relief. We will be back. Depends, you know, <laughs> on your viewpoint. So we. So thanks a lot, Johannes and Matthias. I now put you on the backstage. And yeah, Pia, who
who is our first guest of today? Yes, so our first guest is 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 that B Hero or Omar from B Hero? Let's see, let's see how, how he introduces himself. So he's gonna tell us a lot about uh, what bees and and AI, how they are a match made in heaven, as as he he says in his title, and what also bees um, have, how they have an impact on our ecological system, um, and how their solution can also. Uh, impact that. So I'm quite um, yeah excited for this talk. So without further ado, there he is. Good morning, Omar, or good, good evening day. actually for you. <laughs> yeah, good morning for you. Uh, good evening for me. I'm, uh, I'm in California now, so it's uh, 12 a.m., but uh, that's the quietest time of the day. So it's perfect to be here um, and speak with you guys and hear some questions and thoughts. Yeah. So anyone who, who thinks that it was too early to wake up, um, imagine that Omar stayed awake for you so uh, that we can have his presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm happy. Um, do you want me to start or? Uh, yeah, um, let's, let's, yes, let's, let's hand over the stage to you. We go in the backstage area. And once your talk has concluded, we meet again for the Q&A session. Perfect. Uh, can you see my screen just to make sure? Perfect. Works perfectly. Okay. Well, even with the AI Austria logo. Now, this is these are the best slides I've ever seen. I Thank did my best. Much. I did my best. <laughs> <laughs> so see you later. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, perfect. So I, I think maybe before even uh, even we we before we even start, uh, maybe just to mention that um, we tend to think of bees, or when we think of bees, we mostly think of honey. Um, but bees are actually responsible for pollinating pretty much everything we eat. And this is part of the things that I'm going to touch when we talk about how artificial intelligence and machine learning can help uh, in addressing some of the main concerns uh, of our food production uh, in the next coming years. Um, OK, so uh, if we look at the farming industry in general uh, for the last five, seven years, we've seen a lot of innovation coming into this industry. Uh, I, it all starts from the need to increase the production because we have a lot more people to feed in, in the years to come. Um, and we started to see how smart irrigation and the better use of pesticides and nutrients and how we have you know drones flying all over the place now are helping growers to make data-driven decisions that allows them to increase yields. Um, one of the most important components for food production is pollination. Without pollination, flowers will not turn to be something we can actually eat. Uh, and there are three main mechanisms in nature that get flowers to be pollinated. It could be what's called self-pollination, which is mainly gravity, which means that the pollen will fall and touch the stigma. It could be wind pollination, which means that pollen will be carried by the wind and touch the stigma and pollinate the flower. But for 70 to 75% of the crops out there, this is done by bees, or oh, mainly by bees, but in general by insects, uh, many different types of pollinators. And this worked great for many, many years, but as farming become more and more industrialized and centralized, and we try to get more from every single acre, suddenly we have a system that is stressed. Suddenly we start to see that commercial beekeeping becomes more and more intense and more complicated uh, and more challenging. And, and part of the things that we see today is the phenomenon called colony collapse disorder that gets 40% of bee colonies to collapse every year. And this is not good for biodiversity. This is not good for beekeepers. And this is definitely not good for food production. So. All the things that I mentioned now are not things that I knew four or five years ago before starting Be Hero. I'm coming from the cybersecurity space and I had the chance to connect with a commercial beekeeper, one of my co-founders. And this is what led us to investigate this field and to explore how technology, and in this case, artificial intelligence can be used in such domain. When we looked at pollination in general, we identified several factors that affect the quality of pollination that farmers get today. And there are two main drivers that will affect the quality of pollination that you get. The first one is the quality of hive. If you have a dead hive in your field 
or the colony that you get for your field to pollinate your crops is weak and will collapse in a few days, you're not getting good pollination. The big question is how can we assure that bees are strong? How can we assure that commercial beehives that are being brought into the field when it, when it blooms are strong and efficient colonies? And the second thing is when you have a certain area that needs to be pollinated for a certain crop, certain location, certain varieties, densities, and many other factors that affect pollination, what would be the optimized deployment of those hives to assure the best uh, or, or the optimal pollination that you get? And in order to address those two main drivers, we focused on building a low cost sensor, something that every beekeeper can take and deploy in their hives very simply collecting data from those hives, trying to understand what is it that really happens in those hives. Are those hives strong? Are those hives facing any, any issues? Is the queen performing well? Do they have problem of mites? Um, are they starving? Do they have some sort of bacterial or viral disease that needs to be addressed by the beekeepers in order to avoid those colonies from collapsing? Are there things that we can actually do before it's too late, before the colony has already died? So the first focus of Be Hero was how can we identify, and I'm going to show some examples as we dive a little bit more into the technology, how can we identify those things? The second thing that we started to focus on is how can we actually track and measure pollination activity in real time? How can we identify how many bees are going out there to forage? How many bees are going to visit flowers? How many flowers are being pollinated? Is the pollination done good or not? Are there things that we can do in order to affect pollination? Because we need to remember that there's a short period of time, there's nothing, there's something you can still do. After four to six weeks of bloom, the flowers will dry and fall and that's it. There's nothing much you can do. And by starting to measure pollination activity in large scale, and I'm talking about tens of thousands of hives across multiple years, we started to, uh, we, we, we build models that can actually build expectation models for every single hive before it even deployed into the field to assess what's the efficiency of this hives gonna uh, be when deployed in the field and how it's gonna affect pollination. Um, and, and, and I think the question of one of our efforts was not to focus only on one side of the equation, saying, okay, we have a technology that can help beekeepers to improve the quality of hives. We're going to focus on the beekeepers. But we also have a technology that can help to better strategize your pollination needs. So we want to build some sort of a holistic solution that can address both the beekeepers and the farmers uh, in, this, in this situation. Now, as I mentioned, I'm coming from the cybersecurity space. I used to sit in the office and, you know, look at packets running through the internet and identify if there are any threats. In this world, it's different. In this world, you spend most of your time outside. Uh, at the beginning, you know, being out there, opening hives, installing sensors, trying to gather a lot of information and identify whether technology can actually make a difference. Whether our ability to collect the sound, the temperature, the humidity, the magnetic field, and many other parameters from inside the hives, together with environmental parameters like microclimate, crop type, varieties, densities, location, and so on, can help us to understand what's happening out there. It, it, it's not always yes. It might be that there's nothing we can actually do um, to improve the situation. So we started by building a lot of bee labs in different locations, collecting data, on the individual bee level. What you can see here, it's a bee counter, which is attached to, now we're talking about almost 1,000 hives that allows us to understand what's happening in a hive in a level of a single bee trip. We have scales that allows us to understand the nectar flow to the hive, the pollen flow into the hive, uh, the foraging activity in general. We have the in-hive sensors that allow us to connect, collect the data. And, all this process is done in order to scientifically collect and label data. Every time that we need to send someone to open a hive, we are affecting the superorganism. Every time you want to label the data with an intrusive uh, uh, action of a beekeeper opening the hive, 
you're affecting the data and all those things will affect your ability to actually build and deploy models because when you change the environment you're changing everything um so i think part of the part of the things that you're trying to identify is where are you in the scale between detection to prediction okay putting sensors into hives and identifying that a colony is dead it's not a big problem it's an easy problem you don't need a lot of scientists you not you need a sophisticated technology and you can probably build those models in a few days but it doesn't help much being able to remotely understand if a colony is alive or dead it's not that interesting if we're trying to address the mortality rates of bees, the welfare of bees, the quality of pollination, we need to be able to determine earlier in the process that something is starting. Whether it's already started or whether we know that it's going to start soon because we start to see those patterns that repeats itself whenever this problem occurs. What we can see here is hive's ability to regulate temperature. Inside the hive, it's an incubator. There are eggs, there's the brood, and the colony, the entire colony is, is working and foraging in order to um, provide food to, to the next generation and to the queen. And very simply, you can see that just by collecting temperature samples from inside the hives along the day, we can identify different classes of hives, whether they're strong hives that can regulate temperature in an efficient way, or whether they are almost dead colonies that they don't have in any ability uh, to regulate the temperature. The problem with those models is it's too late. We identified the colony is weak. We don't know why, and there's nothing much you can do. So you give a good indication that you're not getting good quality of bees to the field, but we didn't really solve the problem. Some more sophisticated analytics that we can do is to look into different things like microclimate or other features that affect the bee activity. We can look at how the wind or uh, cloudiness or rain or any other microclimate features affect bee activity by counting the bee trips in specific fields. We can look at the daily pattern, as you can see here, of bees um, a long certain period of time where we measure their activity, how it changes along the day. How do we measure their uh, uh, activity in, in, in hydrating the nectar that they just brought to the colony? And each one of those aspects is a new feature that can feed a model that can allow us to actually predict and early detect the problems when there's still something you can do. How can we identify different patterns in the sound that allows us to understand whether the queen is actually performing well in the colony? And I think part of the, the things that we, we, we maybe need to understand is that the bees react to each other. They know what's happening in the colony. There are different stress levels that occurs in the colony based on the different scenarios that the bees are facing. And if we can just identify the patterns of those issues, then we can actually predict and early detect those things. And bee colonies does not collapse because of a phenomenon. They collapse because of a specific reason. The fact that we see more and more hives collapsing make it make us uh, uh, identify some sort of a phenomenon. Uh, but if the queen is not performing well, we can replace the queen. If the hive is starving, we can feed the, the colonies. If there are problem of mites, we can treat the mites. There are things we can do as long as we detect it early enough. Part of the challenges when addressing this type of a super organism in a very noisy environment is that a lot of things change. There's one thing when you're trying to collect data from a, a sterile environment when you're doing it in a lab and when you're trying to deploy sensors with commercial beekeepers, with commercial hives in, in a constant moving environment uh, where you cannot control what's going to happen. The beekeepers will go and treat their hives whether you want it or not. The beekeepers will move the hives to different locations whether you want it or not. And you need to be able in those noisy environments to provide those models. Um, the, the, the trick I think here is that in order to deploy models the way that you know, we used to do maybe before, or I used to do in the, in the cybersecurity space, 
is you just build on tons of data that you can generate pretty quickly, and then you can run models that we learn a lot and pretty, and, and pretty fast. With biology, it's a bit different because every season is different. Everything that happens can influence a lot in the process. And I'm not young enough to spend, you know, the next 20 years just on collecting data. So part of our challenges in the team was to try and identify how can we make some shortcuts? What are the biological assumptions that we can provide the model with that allow us to, allows the model not to explore all the potential routes from a certain scenario? Maybe just to give a, a simple example, it's unlikely that the colony will lose a queen during the winter and suddenly a new queen will pop out without any intervention of someone. This small and maybe sounds very simple thing allows you to improve significantly the speed of which your models can be trained because you don't need to explore all the options. And what we've built is some sort of a mechanism that we take this very noisy data and we put our assumptions and heuristics and some of the, the, the things that we learn from the literature as well in our experiments that we build. And we build some constraints to the model that make it uh, uh, converge. From that point, we build models and we make decisions. And those decisions are also being validated by those assumptions. And in areas that we see that the assumptions does not hold, then we might send someone to check what's happening. And then we might backtrack and identify at what point the model was wrong and how can we fix it moving forward. And I think this is what allowed us to build uh, very strong models in only four years. I know it sounds a lot in the startup world, but four years for what we're dealing with, it's, 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 it's pretty quickly. Um, so, so it's been a long process and we, we collected tons of data from, from now we have 100,000 hives under management, but, you know, we started with few hives at my co-founder's backyard. And eventually we, we reimagined the way that pollination is provided today. And as I mentioned, we decided not to focus only on one part of the value chain, but to build a holistic solution that can service both the beekeepers and the farmers. And what we provide now is actually precision pollination as a service. Um, I think you're not seeing my screen. Okay. Um, precision pollination as a service, uh, which allows the farmers to show the quality of pollination that they get. And we work very closely with the beekeepers to make sure that they can get the best hives out, the reduce mortality rates and reduce the operational cost. The impact of good quality of pollination is not something that Bee Hero invented or discovered. We are exploring it, we're building case studies, but it was researched by much more, um, by, by smarter people than us in different uh, crops along the, along the years. And we can see a lot of value. And the, I think the surprising part that this is not only for insect pollinated crops. We've seen how rapeseed, canola, was improved in outputs and in the oil content because of cross-pollination, because of insects actually cross-pollinating the flowers, even though it's a self-pollinated crop. We've seen how uh, soybean and coffee, crops that can also um, work without bees, can, can, can benefit. And the question is whether you can build a model that the unit economics will be good enough so you can service more and more crops. Um, so even though we are less focused now on whether we increase yields by 10% or 20% or, or 15%, we mostly focus on how can we make sure that you get the good quality of pollination that you need. I think there's a lot of things that we're going to learn along the way and new crops that will uh, uh, get involved in this process as we bring this new um, new concept or new strategy of pollination. For the last four four years, uh, we've built a lot. We've made a lot of assumptions and we executed pretty well. Um, and this year, we're officially the largest pollination provider in the US, uh, which is uh, quite exciting and quite significant. Um, and, and, and the question and, you know, what we're trying to ask all the time is where do we go from here? What, what's next? Where, where should we aim? What should we do? Because there's a lot of opportunities uh, in this domain. 
And I think that if we look at the beginning and how we started and how we focused on hive monitoring, trying to identify whether we can actually identify if the queen is not performing well, whether we can identify if you have problem of mites. Once we scaled, we understood that we can actually measure pollination activity. And this opened a new world that not only service beekeepers, but now also service growers. And as we started to scale, being able to measure pollination activity, we started to work with seed producers and other companies to try and explore whether we can actually build yield assessment models based on pollination activity. And suddenly, there's a big question. From what scale can you understand where markets are going? And our goal now is to scale significantly, being able to provide new insights, um, being able to compare pollination activities in different orchards along the along different season and identify where the markets are going. Um, and I, I think part of the part of the things that you always keep you excited in this domain that the more data that you collect from those hives, the more scenarios that you see, you understand that we still know nothing. There's so much in this data that we haven't touched yet that you know it just stimulates your brain where you can take it and how building a neural network of hives of bees can allow us to send different things. One of the things that we discovered as part of the different experiments that we've done, that bees predict weather. And by identifying the specific patterns inside the bee colonies, we can actually get shorter weather prediction on specific scenarios. Now, we still need to do it in a larger scale to be very confident in our ability to do it. But assume that you have the ability to know an hour before it rains. There are so many industri industries that can benefit from this information. And the question is, from what scale, what confidence level you need in order to start and address those things. So we are very focused on precision pollination as a service, but we have teams that are exploring how can we utilize this data, even for other domains, because the bees are smart and they know what they do. They've been here for millions of years. They've been through a very uh, optimal process of evolution, and we can learn a lot by just listening uh, and collecting data from their superorganism, from their hives. The reason we decided to shift from the different things we've done before and focus on Be Hero is because it has an impact. I think that the value and the insights that we can generate from those hives, from those tens of thousands and 100,000 hives, does not only serve as our ability to be profitable or to scale or to become the largest pollination provider. I think that our ability to mitigate different risk factors, like the giant Asian hornet, by identifying the patterns of those insects, by allowing and working closely with governmental organization to mitigate this, this risk, to work with big chemical companies to make sure that they can develop better products that are not affecting bees and pollinators, but still allows farmers to grow crops in the demand and, and meet the demand that they, that they face. Um, working on different research on different bee, with different bee species um, and working also with small stakeholders uh, in rural areas to make sure that they can also keep bees in a in a in a smart way that they can also help their farmers to benefit from better pollination um, and I think this is this is what drives us to do what we do and I, th I think maybe just to to conclude um, it doesn't really matter what you eat or drink it affects all of us thirty percent or every third bite of everything we eat was pollinated by a bee. So I think it's not only our choice, it's it's our responsibility to make sure that we can build sustainable environment for bees to thrive while we're trying to meet the demand of the ongoing population. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This is this is incredibly interesting. Also, the scale at which this is happening, this is just, just mind blowing. But yeah, of course, hives have very big numbers. Uh, before we switch to the questions of the audience, uh, I actually have a, have a short question. Uh, when 
let's say, as a layman, I'm not from Agritech. If I see a system like this, my, my first thought is this is mostly for hazard or risk mitigation, you know, to avoid that hives are dying out and so on. How well does it work to improve yield later on? And which actions can you actively take to increase yield? De yeah, depending on the results that you receive from the hive, from an individual hive, for example. Um, so in real time, there are not many things you can do. The question is how well you make sure pollination is is happening. So farmers are know very well today how to provide the best nutrients for the trees, how to irrigate the trees in the most efficient way, how to use pesticides in the most efficient manner. But eventually, if you have 10 million flowers out there blooming and you can pollinate only 5 million of them, you are not going to maximize your outputs. Um, and I, I think it's interesting. Sometimes we look at the outputs per acre and we see that it keeps growing. But some of the things we don't look at is that the densities of crops has also changed and it increased. So we have more plants per acre. And the fact that we increase the output per, per acre doesn't necessarily mean that we increase the outputs per orchard or per a, a single crop. And part of it is that we're not addressing pollination in the most efficient way. It could be other reasons as well. That's, that's I think, the challenge in, in agriculture. Um, so when you assure full pollination and you make sure that every single flower gets the chance to turn out to be something edible, this is where you see the increase in yields. Now, in some crops, farmers already knows it, and this is why they pay premium price for strong bees. It's just very hard to find those strong bees. Um, we're trying not, from, from a sales perspective, we're trying not to focus on increasing yields because there's a lot of lack of credibility in the agricultural space. There are a lot of startup companies that come in one day and say, we're going to help you double your yields. Um, and it's not that simple. It's really done, not that simple. And even if you can show 20% increase in yields, what gives mm -hmm. you the confidence that you're the reason for it? So some of the things, you know, we need to be maybe... Um, not very, um, not to brag about and to think that we are the only reason that, you know, crops were increased. I think we based our assumptions on some of the case studies that we've done and, and some of the other case studies that were done, as I mentioned, by smarter people than us. And it varies between different crops in, in the very interesting researchers that showed, you know, 70% increase in apple production because of uh, uh, good quality of pollination and 15% in pairs. Um, so I think from from a logical perspective, we understand that if if a flower is not pollinated, we lost the opportunity to get an output from this, and we need to make sure that we pollinate every single flower. And this is what we do. We walk on statistics. We walk on expectations. The more flowers we pollinate, we increase the potential of this field to produce more but it's very hard to measure. And this is why you need to be very careful when committing to increasing yields in general. Yeah, so, so, thanks for the deep dive. This, I, <laughs> I guess this made many startup pitches in that area now lots of harder because you shared these insights. Here <laughs> is the, double of, the doubling of the yield. Yeah. Uh, we received one question via LinkedIn. I think, can you, can you read it below? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, okay. Yeah, so so the, I guess everyone sees the question, but in general, it talks about the ability to um, how to deploy those hives in the field. Um, mm -hmm. We identify the different way to address pollination. So the current method of, of deploying hives in the field is deciding how many hives you want to put per acre. And then there's a volatility in the quality of those hives. Our model talks about what's the frame count that you need to make per acre to ensure that you have enough bee trips. Because we track and monitor the hives the entire year and not just during pollination, we know in advance what the strength level of every single colony is going to be. We know how many bee frames, how many brood frames, uh, and what's the status of the colony in general. And we can make sure that when the beekeepers deploy the hives in the field, they do it in a in a way that levels the quality and the strength across the field and providing better pollination. So if you try to think of it from a, again, a intuitive perspective, bees are very efficient. 
the bees will go out and will find the, the closest resource of food so they can pollinate. Like pollination is a side effect of them bringing food to the colony. So if you deploy hives in the right distance and you maintain some sort of a balanced strength level across the field, you will get the best the best pollination quality because the bees will not need to trip to, to fly very far to bring food, which means that every bee can do more than several trips a day uh, to bring food. So yes, this is this is exactly part of the of the process of optimizing deployment and making sure that you get balanced pollination across your fields. Excellent. Thanks a lot. So yeah, we're a little bit behind time, but I think we can still take two questions. So if I hand over to Pia. Yeah, sure. So Omar, two more, two more questions. Maybe we can quickly go through them. Um, so one question came, came in. Uh, could your system identify the impact of recent disasters, for example, wildfires or higher temperature? If yes, how do these disasters affect the hives? Um, so unfortunately, at the moment, we cannot identify wildfires wildfires we unfortunately had approximately 500 hives last year that were um, in a wildfire with our sensors so we might be able to identify what's happening in those hives uh, we haven't done it yet but I, I don't have any idea whether we can do it i do have indications as i mentioned about a uh, rain uh, wind and cloudiness so when weather is getting to a point that bees do not want to uh, uh, pollinate this is where we get good indications uh, higher temperature, uh, I don't know yet. I guess those are some of the things that we'll have to to understand. Um, so, I, short, the question is no. We don't know about wildfires and higher temperature, but I believe there are some things we might be able to do moving yeah. forward, hopefully. With some of the secrets that are still inside the data, as you said, I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, resources, that's the problem. Um, Great. And then there's one more. Um, is the problem of disappearing beehives more pressing in the US than in other places? How do you see developments in France regarding herbicides? Okay, this is a specific France question. Let me, let's see if you can answer it. Yeah. So, so I think for many years, uh, people uh, believe that in the US, the situation is, is worse in terms of the mortality rates. Uh, I think if you look at it on, from an average perspective, that's probably the case. And the reason is that in the US, all the hives will shift towards almond pollination. Um, so you get a lot of mix of hives. And I think part of the problem of colony collapse is when you take hives from a certain point to a different point and they infect each other with different diseases. Uh, unfortunately, I heard just this year that in Northern France, there was 80% mortality rates in some of the regions. So I, I think if, if we're trying to average things, we need to understand that we lose a lot of data if we look at the certain reg regions, there are regions that the mortality rates are much more significant than what we see on average in the US. Um, so unfortunately, it's, it's not positive, but, but it seems like um, we need to do something and pretty quickly. And it's not just one place that is more problematic than others. Yeah. So you are focused on the place where people drink the most almond milk in California. So that's the reason why you're situated there. Is that the reason? Uh, the reason we focus on, on California is because 80% of almond production is done in California and almonds are 100% independent on bees and there's a shortage of bees uh, in the US. So it, it makes for us the least resisting path um, to bring the goods to our customers. Uh, but we do have some operation in Europe, in South Africa and in Israel, and we're looking to expand. COVID changed some of our plans, as you can imagine, because of the complicated logistics. Uh, but we're positive that soon uh, we can back, go back to normality and expand. Sounds good. Well, thanks so much, Omar, for also answering these questions and your exciting talk, first one of the day. And thanks for staying up so late for us. Thank you so much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, thank, thank you. you and have a nice, uh, not evening, night. <laughs> thank so, you. Good. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye -bye. Bye. Perfect. So, who is speaker number two? Yes. So, we know about all about the precision farming efficiency and really going by the unit or even here by the drop, um, how yields been, can be increased. And we are happy to welcome Martin Rahaf. The director of business development from CropX, 
um, who claim that they are the most scalable precision farming platform. So let's see what he can tell us all about that. So let's get him on the stage. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Hi. Hello. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I see you also already shared your slides. So yeah, as usual, the stage is yours and see you later in the Q&A session. Perfect. So you can hear me well, you can see me well. Can I start? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, CropEx is an ag analytics company founded in Israel in 2015 with a sole vision to revolutionize and automate the farm and the decision making process by mastering the insights of the soil. When we started our journey, um, we noticed that despite the ag tech revolution, hundreds of startups in the space all promise big things, help growers grow more using less. We saw that despite all of these great solutions, farmers still remain blind to what happens inside their soils. And as a result, they irrigate and fertilize inefficiently, inaccurately, in a completely unsustainable manner, making agriculture a highly polluting industry. This is because uh, most ag tech startups focused on above ground data, like satellite imagery, uh, drones, cameras that you can mount on tractors and stuff like that. Uh, and no one kind of focused on data that you could get from soil. This is because the above ground data is very scalable and affordable, easy to obtain, whereas to have soil data requires using very complicated, cumbersome, expensive, difficult to use sensors. But when it comes to irrigation management and nutrition management, the above ground data only allows you to be reactive and not predictive and preventive. This is because by the time there are visible signs of stress that you can detect from an image that was taken from space, that means the damage has already been done and there's going to be a guaranteed yield reduction. But by monitoring the soil in real time, we can really be predictive and preventive, knowing that a plant hasn't received enough water or fertilizer before the plant does. And that's what CropEx is all about. So the first thing we realized is that we have to reinvent the hardware, the soil sensing solution, so that we can collect huge amounts of soil data in a scalable, affordable, accurate way. So the first thing we did is we developed our own proprietary soil sensors, which are really the most scalable, the only scalable solution in the market. And we integrated that with above ground data that you will see later on uh, to provide irrigation management solutions. Gradually, we've expanded to also handle nutrition management. And most recently, we've added the one final missing piece, crop protection management, to establish a one-stop shop farm management system. The way it works is that the soil sensors collect soil data uh, and transmit it directly to the cloud with a SIM card or other connectivity solutions like LoRaWAN or Sigfox or even satellite connectivity transmitted directly to the cloud and we automatically integrate it with all these above ground data layers. So topography, um, crop models that we develop in house, weather data like wind speed, evapotranspiration, precipitation, uh, humidity, satellite imagery. We have an entire uh, remote sensing team that develop our own proprietary in house optical and radar image processing algorithms, not just the standard uh, outdated NDVI, but far more than that. User inputs, soil maps, hydraulic models, and everything gets crunched in the cloud together using very advanced machine learning algorithms and AI to provide bottom line actionable insights that are crop specific, growth stage specific via our app that is available on iOS, Android, and web. So the sensors, if you can see here, they collect uh, soil moisture, soil temperature, and soil EC, electrical conductivity. You can also, by the way, communicate directly uh, via Bluetooth with your phone in case there's no cellular network uh, in your region. Moving forward, this is kind of a, a grocery list of the features that we now have thanks to the development that we've achieved, but also thanks to the acquisitions. So if we started just with irrigation management, you can see now that we offer far more than that. So really a, 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 a holistic platform. In terms of validation, this is just one example out of, of many. Uh, We've had many commercial trials and validations by third party. So for example, the, the circle that you see at the top, that's a, a pivot, uh, center pivot irrigation, a 50 hectare 
uh, pivot irrigated alfalfa field in Arizona, United States, where we ran a one year experiment, proper A-B testing, comparing the farmer's standard practice to the automatically generated irrigation prescriptions uh, by the CropEx app. And we managed to deliver 10% more yield with 40% less water. And we've had similar success across many different crop types and geography. For example, you can see this image below of the eggplant trial we had in Japan. We also had a lemon trial there. And you can see that we've had um, almonds and citrus and uh, potatoes and many different crop types, many different irrigation system types. And this is just the beginning. CropEx collaborates with the entire ag food value chain from crop insurance to agribusinesses, trading companies, agrochemical, OEM, irrigation system manufacturers. And the value that we deliver to the end user, that the farm, the producer, is savings on, on water, fertilizer, uh, manual labor, energy, uh, travel that uh, that no, 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 not necessary anymore to travel as frequently as the field um, allows to remotely monitor uh, and becoming more envir uh, environmentally sustainable by maximizing the yield potential and minimizing the input application. In terms of deployment, uh, we started selling in the United States in 2017, and we very rapidly expanded to, and we nowadays cover 47 countries uh, worldwide. Uh, in 2020, the, when there was a complete global shutdown and all ag tech companies had to stop projects because it requires their physical presence, having boots on the ground, we continued sales as usual and we actually quadrupled our sales in 2020. And this is thanks to our do-it-yourself approach. The fact that we don't have to be there to install the sensor because our sensor is really plug and play. But most importantly, this vast deployment now allows us to, uh, to do things that we couldn't do before. The amount of data that we collected allows us to develop machine learning models, neural network, deep learning that require huge amounts of data that really no one else has because we have now more than 10,000 systems deployed worldwide. So 10,000 data points of soil in real time, which is the leading company in the world in terms of, of real time and soil data points. Um, we've completed three acquisitions and we're not through. Uh, we have an appetite for more acquisitions coming up. So we're establishing ourselves as the market consolidator. Uh, and each one of these acquisitions added both technological and commercial capabilities to CropEx. So Crop Matrix uh, was a competitor based in the United States who developed an irrigation management app using a third party soil sensor. They developed a really uh, well-oiled distribution channel of more than 150 dealers providing services to more than 1,500 clients. But the unscalable soil sensor that they used that required using a separate modem, gateway, power source, cables, made it very unscalable, allowed them really to only offer uh, an unscalable product to farmers. So every farmer had maximum just one sensor, and it took an entire day to deploy just one system. It was also very expensive. So with that acquisition, we've actually replaced the hardware with our own, merged the two software uh, into one single powerful app and uh, started offering a, more, a far more scalable solution to U.S. farmers. The second acquisition uh, of uh, New Zealand-based region uh, actually expanded CropEx into a new industry, the dairy, uh, the dairy industry. Because in New Zealand, there's a lot of farmers who apply the, the dairy effluent as new as fertilizer onto the soil. Uh, and they also used a third party soil sensor. So we've added a really unique capability to CropEx with that acquisition. Last but not least, uh, DACOM, the third acquisition, uh, which was just in last August, are a Netherlands based uh, company established in 1984, kind of the pioneer, one of the pioneers of, of ag tech who developed their own weather stations and gateways. But most importantly, uh, they, add, they created a really powerful pest and disease management solution that is preventive. So just by knowing what the crop type is, the soil type conditions, the weather data, they provide a, what are the, the possible threats and how to prevent them from even taking place in the first place. And that, that added kind of the one final missing piece of the puzzle to CropEx. 
These are just uh, a few recent commercial highlights. Um, these are all publicly available. So the first, uh, the first one is the, the number of sensors that we shipped during a global shutdown, during a global pandemic, which really comes to show how scalable uh, our solution is. Uh, we have a partnership with Renki. Renki is the third largest uh, irrigation system manufacturer in the world, uh, who by partnering with CropEx, now we are their agronomic brain. They can, for the first time, help their grow, their users, figure out not just, you know, to irrigate, but how, when, how much, where to irrigate. We partnered with NASA as part of their uh, global efforts to tackle food security issues. We were recently awarded by the World Economic Forum as a one, one of the 100 tech pioneers. And we have a strategic collaboration with PepsiCo where we're helping PepsiCo help their potato growers grow potato more significant, uh, more sustainably. For example, uh, the trial results where we managed to deliver uh, better yield with 25% less water, 9% less greenhouse emissions, 13% uh, less fertilizer used. We have an amazing team and you're gonna have to, to trust me on this. Uh, and we have all the relevant expertise in-house from agronomy, data science, remote sensing, software development, electromechanical engineering, everything we need to execute on our $1 billion vision of becoming the global leader. Uh, our CEO is a fourth time CEO and a former VC. Our president and CRO uh, served as the CEO and president of Netafim, United States, the global drip irrigation leader. Uh, and we also have John Gates, our, our VP product, who used to work for Crop Matrix, the company that we acquired, but before that, he worked for the Climate Corporation. We're backed by a world-class syndicate of strategic partners and investors from the entire ag food value chain who are supporting CropEx with, with industry knowledge, network, and funding. Uh, what we're looking for is to engage with any strategic partners to explore potential collaborations. Um, so I'd be happy to hear from you and thank you so much for your time, for listening. I, we're going to open the stage for questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Martin, for, for the introduction. And I'm, I, I just realized there's a connection to the climate corporation. So I, I did not have this on the radar because it's funny. The founder of the Climate Corporation was at one of our events two years ago. Shiraj Kalik, he's now at Atomico in London. So this is like full circle. You meet everybody on the stage of the AIC. Uh, <laughs> we also, by the way, we now have uh, our platform supports integration with my John Deere, with Renki, but also with, with Climate's Field View. Excellent. So coming to the questions. Yeah. Yeah, let's take the, the first one. Uh, are there any second order effects your system is able to track in advance like natural disasters? So for now, uh, our main focus is, is helping farmers. Uh, we help them prevent crop disaster. I wouldn't, um, but uh, <laughs> by, just by, you know, optimizing production. But I, I would say that... Um, uh, predicting natural disasters is, is currently our focus, perhaps later on. Okay. And uh, yeah, to, to, to split it 50-50, perhaps Pierre would like to ask the second question. Sure. So Martin, another question, I think this is also going into the security issue of infrastructure. How do you see sensors developing in the coming years, more edge AI, and if yes, which functionalities? So that's a great question. And, you know, hardware development is extremely hard. This is kind of one of the reasons why startup avoid hardware as, as much as they can. Uh, this is kind of what I started my, my pitch with. Is, and this is why I think a lot of the ag tech companies put all of their attention on the above ground data and not on sensors. Uh, because it takes, you know, it takes years uh, to get the sensors to be uh reliable accurate affordable manufacturable and this is an, an, an ongoing journey so it took us years to get to where we are right now years of, of blood pain and, and tears uh but right now we finally have you know a really stable product that we're that we are 
really confident with. And still we're looking for uh, always thinking about how we can add additional capabilities to the sensors. Um, there are already some solutions out there in the market that are looking to measure uh, nutrient concentrations in the soil. But this is a huge, huge gap that we, I haven't seen any success in, in this regard yet because just to kind of, I don't want to take you too deep into soil science, um, but to, to, to just to understand what are the three macro elements, NPK, so nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, these are the three nutrients that crop need. Just to do that, you need to take out a soil sample, take it to the lab, saturate it with water, pump out the water, and then run it through spectrophotometers. Like there are 16 different tests just to know what are the NPK levels are. So to do that in soil, in real time, without needing to calibrate, uh, that is very far from, from reality. But we're already starting to, to work in this regard. Another huge uh, important factor that is affecting everyone right now is is greenhouse greenhouse emissions so this is also something that we're thinking about how to quantify these things that there are a lot of companies making you know false claims about how they're uh, helping to reduce uh, emissions uh, so to to be able to measure that directly that that would be a, a great feature okay it's interesting to hear that you're also working in that direction um, maybe bef before we maybe get some other questions from any participants, I maybe have one from my side. So you were, um, I was quite surprised that you say COVID crisis in 2020 did not, not hit you because the system is so easy to install. I think you said plug and play, do it yourself. So, so is what, what prior knowledge is, um, is, uh, is required or how can I imagine this if I'm now a farmer um, installing your system? So one of the, one of the the journeys that Cropix uh, has been on for years is how to get the the system to be as easy to use as possible. Uh, you know, in different countries, fa it, farmers kind of have different backgrounds, different uh, scientific expertise, and we discovered that you know it. it in many countries, it's a very traditional occupation passed by generation to generation. So, you know, uh, kids do what their parents did for decades, just like, you know, tasting the soil to, and, and take, uh, following their gut instincts on when to irrigate, how to irrigate. Um, so we realized that the only way we can really make a global impact is by making, delivering a product that really anyone could use. And to do that is it's all about the, the front end, you know, how to make things as streamlined as possible and require as little uh, inputs by the end user as possible, because that usually creates a big bottleneck. You know, farmers are really busy. They expect the solution to create less work for them and not more. So if the, the app requires huge hassle, or attending to the sensors to download data or to calibrate the sensors or to enter a lot of manual inputs into the app, this becomes a pain point uh, or, or, or a bottleneck. So this is what I would recommend if you really want to work with farmers, you have to make the, it's as plug as play and possible. Uh, and in terms of, of COVID, we were really fortunate to, uh, you know, to be enough funded and to have a product that can be shipped without require our physical presence and to have enough inventory uh, mm. so that uh, we're really fortunate in this regard. And it actually, in a way, you know, th that pandemic accelerated ag tech adoption in a way because farmers were simply unable to attend to their field, to drive to their field, to know if their crops are about to, to die because they don't have enough water. So they realized, well, I have to start investing and solutions to be able to remotely manage my fields and know what's going on without me physically being there. Mm -hmm. Maybe just yeah. also a follow up question here. So, and what's the, the minimum size of, of a farm where your system gets a return on investment? If I'm thinking also about European farms often being very small um, structured. 
That's a really good question. Uh, it, it, I mean, technologically, we can support any type of, of, of field size, but it really all comes uh, to an ROI because the cost of the system is, is, is given. And then as you scale down the field size, the ROI gets farther away. So, But we actually work in, even in India where the average field size is 0 0.5 hectares. It really all depends on... Um, on the business model that we develop with the strategic partner who are reselling our system. Uh, so when it comes to huge deployment, we can also support very small average field size if the numbers still in a globe, in a kind of macro perspective makes sense. Okay, thanks a lot. Perfect, uh, maybe one, 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 one final question. Because when you say uh, the the, the COVID, the pandemic was accelerating the, the rollout of this type of solutions. This means you now have more transparency and be, for better analytics and so on. Do you see that this is driving some faster best practice transfer across the globe? Because I'm, I'm thinking of other industries, let's say automotive. Uh, you have a metric like engineering hours per vehicle. So once this metric was established, it was very easy to, to, to compare Chinese, Japanese and US car makers. Or the same goes for logistics with, with just in time and so on. Do you see something like this now coming now that the data transparency is here? Well, I, I think I think, yes, uh, you can see that ag tech adoption is still relatively low in average and it's also depending on, on the geography it's much more advanced in the united states uh compared to france for example so if in the united states we're looking at 30 percent, then in france we're talking about five percent uh sometimes even less than that but but i think one proof of the fact that everyone are realizing the importance is the continuously increasing number of of investment uh, of the private sector in ag tech. It's becoming f from an industry that was completely, you know, neglected. It, it's, it's becoming one of the biggest booming. The ag food tech is one of the biggest booming industries. And there's just lots of, 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 of funding being poured onto this industry because everyone realized that it, this is maybe, you know, uh, compared to other industries where it's nice to have, this is not, uh, we don't have a choice the the world population is doubling i don't want to go into the you know the common cliches of why ag tech but the population uh, is rising doubling we have to feed more mouths we have with less land less water available so we really don't have a choice but to maximize our yield potential by using technological solutions so the time is now uh we don't have a choice perfect great I think that were, were some good uh, last words, right, Clemens? <laughs> Time <Yeah>. is now. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, yeah, if people want to engage with, with Matan and Propix, as usual, please head over to, to B2Match. And with this, yeah, thanks a lot for joining. And Thanks a lot, Matan. Thanks for, for inviting me. Have a great day and enjoy the, the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. So um, yesterday we already uh, went a bit into animal health uh, with Smackstack from Austria and now we have the pleasure to welcome another speaker in this area um, all the way from Kenya. Um, so um, Alan Tolo is the CEO and co and founder of MyFugo Innovations and uh, will tell us the his perspective on, on animal health, and let's see how that also compares to, to what we heard yesterday. Hello, Hi, everyone. good morning. Hi. Good morning. Hi. From, where, from where are you joining us today? Uh, from Nairobi, Nairobi, Kenya. That's great. I think I think this is why, um, like distant wise, uh, a great, um, uh, all over the world, I think we have people joining. So that's great to also have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Gives a wider perspective to AI. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Clemens, any, any last words from you? Otherwise, I think we're ready for the presentation, right? Exactly. The, the usual drill. The stage is yours. And uh, we will come back to the stage with the questions from the audience later on. Okay. So um, see you in a moment. Bye. See you.
Oh, bye. Okay, thank you everyone. My name is Alan Tolo, um, presenting for Kenya. I'm the CEO of uh, Mifugo. Now, primarily Mifugo supports dairy smallholder farmers in Kenya. And this is a very important aspect, looking at it from a technology point of view, uh, using the smart cow collar, how to use embedded technology to help the small dairy farmer increase uh, their dairy productivity. However, let's go back and understand uh, the country itself. Uh, with a population of 53 million, we have 80% who are smallholder farmers. And this population, 70% are actually rural people, meaning they primarily rely on agriculture. Livestock contributes 12% uh, to the Kenya's GDP. And Kenya as a whole has 7 million dairy cows. Africa has 49 million dairy cows. And so with this number, then we need to understand the customer, uh, the rural dairy farmer. They are in Kenya, 2 million small scale dairy farmers. That is actually 80% of the total dairy farmers in Kenya. And this smallholder dairy farm only keeps between one and six cows, uh, average actually being around uh, four cows. They produce, the cow produces a measly five liters of milk uh, per day. Compare that to the developed worlds where a cow would produce around 25 uh, liters of milk per day. And so uh, this dairy farmer is only producing around 20% uh, of comparative uh, production in milk yield. And of course, they also rely on other uh, sources of income such, such as crop farming. 60% of them are women. Uh, but as we've said, Kenya is still the highest producer of dairy in Africa, uh, outside South Africa. We are the only country in Africa that produces both for our internal consumption as a country and exports it to other countries. And yet we have great inefficiencies in terms of dairy uh, productivity. Uh, our per capita production is 110 liters. And uh, in the next 10 years, the vision 2030 dream is to have a per capita production of 220 liters, which is doubling it. So what are the problems? As much as they are producing or we are producing relatively well compared only in Africa, we still have very low calving intervals. One cow uh, would calve every 640 days. Yet in the Western world, one cow would calve every 400 days. And so that's 50% inefficiency. Uh, rampant diseases such as East Coast fever which can easily be solved through technology. Low milk production and of course, fewer cows in a cow's lifetime. And the most important now going through climate change is high methane production. One cow produces methane equivalent to burning 1000 liters of petrol. One cow's methane production in a year is equivalent to 1,000 liters of petrol. And yet our farmers would still keep many unproductive cows instead of having fewer productive ones. And this would not only contribute to better productivity, but uh, positive action towards climate change. And so Mifugo developed its own uh, cow collar, a smart cow collar that adva ad take advantage of data insights such as body temperature, movement, cow's behavior and motion in order to predict better stress events. So in essence, being able to tell the farmer when the cow is ready for insemination 
being able to inform the farmer if there are any disease occurrences based on the cow's body temperature. Enabling early uh, veterinary interventions. For example, when the cow is sick and there are early signs, then there's a simple SMS that goes to the veterinary doctor. He's able to then apply corrective interventions. Giving the farmer assisted management in terms of the cow's behavior so as to realize a better productivity. Our technology is simply based on a USSD uh, of an IoT network or the simple GSM network uh, integrated with a mobile app or using simple SMSs to the farmers. Remember within the rural farmers also challenges within uh, using of a mobile app might render them not getting the information on time. And that's why we use integrated platforms such as simple USS, uh, USSD, stroke SMS, and the mobile app. Now, how our model works is to integrate uh, predictive uh, behavior or interpret predictive behavior based on simple insights. Giving simple scenarios, you'd find that a cow would have an average number of steps in a day. Combined with body temperature, for example, two data points, you would be able to predict whether this cow is having normal behavior today or it's having abnormal behavior. Um, we are able to invoke some form of interpretation towards the cow's health. Uh, for example, if it's not behaved in terms of uh, normal steps count, and there's a combination of a higher body temperature, then there's a likelihood that the cow is sick. This information is streamed to the farmer and also to the veterinary doctor. We've had cases where uh, a cow was due for calving and developed complication. Our model predicted this and intervention by the veterinary doctor uh, enabled positive uh, steps taken in order to save not only the calf and also uh, the cow. We have models which predict, say, milk production uh, in slightly uh, different variants. You'd find that there is a correlation between how long a cow is sitting down and chewing its cud and the amount of milk is produced that day. Using comparative analysis, we are able to predict whether this cow is having better production out of its restfulness, how it's sleeping, how it's sitting down, uh, related also to how the, the amount of milk it has produced. But the most important, of course, within our uh, sphere is the estrus events. Quite difficult to predict, but then being able to reduce the calving days, knowing when the cow is actually uh, ready for insemination has positively impacted better and increased inseminations, which have led to more calving. That in essence reduces the calving interval and produces, uh, helps the cow to produce our, our more milk. So our solution has uh, rendered as uh, the farmers uh, having reduced calving intervals, better detection in body temperature. Uh, more important uh, figuratively is the assisted dairy management. And remember, this is a smallholder farmer who would otherwise not have this uh, technology able to assist him or her to produce better, uh, product, uh, better uh, higher milk uh, from the cows or realize higher milk yield uh, from the cows. And this impact is felt when we actually reduce, have a 10% increase in calving intervals. Yeah. We have uh, up to 30% uh, in terms of health interventions. And we've also had around uh, 20 percent, uh, between 10 and 20 percent in increased income. However, within Mifugo, we still have our problems. Remember, this is something we've done only for the last two years. And so 
we still have challenges in terms of data collection. Uh, within Africa, there are different scenarios. There is uh, mixed farming, as you said, there's zero grazing, there's uh, pasture grazing. And so how do you collect enough data within these scenarios? For example, in zero grazing, we have uh, very confined spaces with which the cows are allowed to graze in. And this limited movement uh, then uh, compromises on the amount of data that we can collect, leading of course to less precision in terms of our prediction. Um, identifying the grazing setups uh, and then building a model that fits that grazing setup has been more or less the functional and working uh, scenario. Call it case studies which are more successful. And so the model, whether it fits all is still questionable because you have different scenarios. And based on that, then our prediction, uh, you find that we need more data points. We need more scenarios. Uh, even within the dairy cows themselves, there are different scenarios. You have a cal first calva and a third calva. You may, uh, the sensor may not be able to predict but it's not that the sensor is not working, it's other related issues that apply to the cow that makes it not work. Uh, for example, you could have a sensor that's working well, but uh, the farmer has not been feeding his cow with consistent nutrition. And this compromises on its ability uh, to have an estrus event. And so these kind of scenarios have made the prediction uh, compromise with um, need to have more data, better refined scenarios before we can expand it and, and, and scale. Needless to say that, of course, the, the building of the model requires uh, machine learning experts and uh, lack of enough experts to give, to give us uh, this scenario, to build this scenario, then either extends the period of which we are able to come with better precision um, uh, kind of prediction, or then increase the pool and see how to refine each case by case scenario. So thank you very much. Uh, the summary, of course, is that with the use of AI, we see innovative ways in Kenya and Africa as a whole, which we can help smallholder farmers increase their uh, productivity. Uh, the farmers remain in traditional setups, and it's only enablers that technology, like technology, that can be a game changer in order to make things uh, uh, change and actually address the SDG goals, which is reducing uh, poverty and even better uh, economic livelihoods. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alan, for, for this great presentation and also insight not only to, I think we've seen European and um, US agriculture, but also give an insight more on Eastern Africa. So thanks for that as well. Um, so I, I think what, what I um, what I found quite surprising is that some of the the problems or issues that you face were actually quite quite similar with with what we also sometimes hear in Europe. Like um, um, it must be easy to access, right? Um, it must also work on a small scale. So that's quite interesting. Um, we already have some questions here. So, Ellen, if, if that's okay for you, I'll, I'll read them for you. Um, so, the first one is, how do you extract real body temperature from the neck? What is the battery life of the device? Okay, thank you. So, there are two ways. For us, we, we, we went for the actual external collar, which uh, has a sensor embedded on that collar, and this sensor lies on the on the neck of the of the of the cow, uh, this is enough uh, through a touch basis to uh, stream the or capture the body temperature. 
Um, depending on the movement of the cow, for example, sometimes it would be bending out and eating. You are able to, you, you, we end up filtering uh, the body temperature to identify the right one uh, from one which was, can you call it, detached from the skin of the cow. So having data streaming in, let's say, 10 body temperatures in a day, we are able to identify that uh, these four were valid on the cow's neck, as in they touched the cow's neck, and the other six were based on movement, and so you uh, isolate them. Uh, the battery life on the device is one year, uh, but we are currently experimenting having a solar uh, embedding some small solar panel on the on the collar so as to be able to increase the battery life of, of the device. Of course, it would call for a different kind of battery, but then increase uh, the, the life of this, uh, this battery. We are very privileged to have warm weather, uh, better part of the year, I think eight months out of 12. And so tapping from solar energy is, uh, uh, is an advantage uh, to the solar, uh, the sensor that, that we were using. Thanks, quite interesting. Um, I'm gonna start already with the next question. So how flexible is the system to analyze different breeds of cows and how long does it take to add a new breed to the system? Okay, so by breed, I imagine uh, the, the question is about, let's say if it's a Frisian or a Gansi as compared to a local breed uh, of, of cow in, 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 in Kenya. Now, this work mainly for the exotic breeds. Uh, so primarily what you'd also have in Europe, uh, whether it's a Frisian or Gansi, uh, these have got uh, more predictive ways of analyzing their data and very, very different from a local breed of, of cow. Uh, please understand that it is the local breeds also that we are advocating for less use of these breeds. Of course, yes, they are more drought, uh, drought resistant, but they have very poor productivity. So they're the kinds that you'd have a farmer keeping 10, but only having one liter of milk from the combined as compared to one breed, which is an exotic breed that the farmer would keep just one animal and enjoy 20 liters of milk. Uh, how long it takes to add a new breed? It's a matter of uh, between two and three months. Most of the breeds are related. And so with other scenarios such as the setup, the area of movement, uh, the kind of dairy management, if it ticks the boxes that it is the same scenario that we have applied elsewhere, then it would immediately work for this farmer. There are geoclimatic differences. For example, there's an area which is primarily cold as opposed to an area which is primarily hot. And then that would also, again, take time for the model to have, uh, to, to have the patterns or understand the patterns and then immediately apply on the breeding question. Thank you. Oh, th thanks so much for, for the answer here. I, I hope that that answered that person's question, but I think this was uh, quite, quite well answered. Um, there's one more question, and I guess you've also been asked that on B2Match, or at least that, that's what uh, Hamid Benga might be referring to. Um, the question is, how do you extract real body temperature from the neck? Oh, okay. So this is already the There's one. That one. Yeah. yeah. So then, so maybe um, I can follow up with, with one more question from my side. I, I remember also um, uh, going through, through your website and, and presentation. Um, you also talk a lot about the affordability and different financing systems uh, for, for the smart collar. Maybe you can talk a bit more about that as well. Okay. So we have two models. Uh, Farmers belong to cooperative societies, so they come together, form unions for their common uh, objectives. And so these cooperative societies then buy the collars in uh, uh, relatively good numbers uh, in a bulk from Mifugo. 
uh, for onward uh, provision to their uh, farmers. We find this model uh, much better because the unions are able, they have the financial muscle then to buy and then give it to the farmers and deduct the amount of a period of time from their milk sales. So the mm -hmm. farmer would not primarily pay the cooperative society, but have the equivalent of three or five liters of milk being deducted on a monthly basis towards the column. The individuals who would come who don't belong to the cooperatives, we use a pay-as-you-go model. And so you use the collar over a period of 10, uh, 12 months, and you're able to pay a small amount to Mifugo on a monthly basis. And so this has made it uh, quite affordable as opposed to outright purchase, uh, which is quite difficult because the farmer wants to uh, enjoy the benefits of the census first, the callers uh, before he starts uh, paying at least the outright cash. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. I think that, that sounds quite innovative also, not only for the technology, but also for the for the financing part. So that's uh, great to hear that you're also considering innovations in, in that area. Um, Alan, any last words from your side? I don't think we've received any more questions. So anything else you wanted to say at this point? Well, thank you for having me. Hope it gives a perspective from a different part of the world. Uh, in the same journey, but in different steps, and uh, hope to engage in uh, more of these uh, uh, discussions. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot, Alan. So, uh, as Alan mentioned, if you want to get in touch with him, feel free to reach out via the B2Match platform, see if he still has some meeting slots available. And I see that we're a bit ahead of time, but uh, I've been told that Ben is already here. So um, we can start introducing the next round of talks that um, evolve around the topic of the age of robots, uh, which apparently is here. Or let's see if, um, if our speakers would agree that uh, this, the age of robots is here. Uh, and the first one is the age of robots on the ground from Ben Scott Robinson. He's the co-founder and CEO of the small robot company. And um, their aim is to use robots to bring regenerative agriculture to farmers. I think that's quite a, quite a great aim. And um, yeah, I'm happy to introduce Ben on the stage if we can have him. Hello, Pierre. Uh, thank you very much for um, uh, asking me to, to present today. It was a very exciting opportunity. And uh, I'd just like to say how much I enjoyed Alan's presentation as well. I think it's it's absolutely fascinating uh, bringing that level of technology to to, to areas that uh, most need it, which is, which is brilliant. Absolutely. So, yeah, so, so um, my name is uh, Ben Scott Robinson. Um, uh, as you mentioned, co-founder and CEO of the Small Robot Company. And we are a very mission-driven uh, business, and our mission is to help the farmers of the world's largest crops feed the world while regenerating the planet. So, uh, you know, other farming robotics companies seek to simply automate existing processes, such as weeding or picking, um, whereas we are looking to deliver the next generation of farming, you know, a new way uh, of growing food, uh, and we mm -hmm. call it per-plant farming by understanding and treating each plant individually, we can strip out all the inefficiencies and the vast overuse of chemicals uh, and allow the soils to regenerate themselves. So this saves 90% of inputs, increases yields, uh, and also locks carbon into the soil. Wow, sounds fascinating. Ben, um, if you want, then I'll leave the stage to you. Um, okay. And then we can also see if your presentation can come online. Great. And then I'll see you for any questions and Q&A afterwards. Okay. Thank you, Pierre. Sorry. Sorry. Apologies. Um, so arable farming is one of the world's largest industries. It's worth more than Meta and Tesla combined, although interestingly, not as much as Apple. But there we go. Um, but it's stale. Uh, it's controlled by a few slow-moving behemoths 
uh, that are locked into the status quo. Uh, and because of this, in many parts of the world, cereal farmers are really in trouble. Uh, they are huge challenges being placed in the way uh, the world's biggest crops are currently grown. Uh, the system is broken, it's inefficient, uh, and it's just getting more expensive while yields have flatlined. And in the last few years, we've actually seen yields decrease. Big, imprecise machinery is wasting 90% of the chemicals we use and actively damaging the soils. And this is making the process of farming inherently unprofitable. And governments are having to step in and support farming through subsidies or insurance. And the damage caused by the very machinery and chemistry designed to make farming more efficient is destroying soils and ecosystems. So this is also making crops less resilient, less nutritious, uh, and more vulnerable to climate change. And farming contributes you know, anything up to 20% uh, of all um, carbon emissions um, uh, to date. And at the same time, government and consumers are facing more pressure to produce food sustainably. So with fewer and fewer chemicals and ultimately become a remover of greenhouse gases rather than emitter. So to fix this, something fundamental has to change in the way that cereal crops are grown. So this isn't an evolution. Uh, to do this, you really got to design the complete service from the ground up. But the results will make the tractor as redundant as the tractor made the horse. You know, this approach uses lightweight autonomous vehicles to provide a near real-time view of each crop plant as it grows through the season and then deliver precise and timely interventions to make that plant achieve its full potential. To deliver this, you need an end-to-end -end service, one that cares for the crop from before the seed is planted right up to the point of harvest. A service that looks after the crop throughout its life uh, and a suite of robots to do that. So I'd like to introduce you to Tom, Dick, Harry, and Wilma. So Tom lives on the farm, continuously gathering data on the plants and the environment. Wilma is the brains of the operation, converting Tom's data into instructions for Dick and Harry. And we call this per plant intelligence. <clears throat> but Dick nurtures and protects the crop. He goes out and kills weeds individually uh, with electricity and sprays only the plants that need it. Harry precisely plants the crop at exactly the right depth and spacing for the conditions, giving it the best chance of the highest yields. And even before Dick and Harry are ready, farmers can use our per plant intelligence now, making their equipment much more efficient and making the transition to robot farming seamless. And we call this per plant action. And far, uh, customers, farmers don't buy the robots. They pay per hectare for the service. U ultimately, they pay for the delivery of healthy crop. And this works for farmers because it strips out all the wasteful capital expenditure uh, and they don't have to upgrade with new expense every time the service gets better. It also works for the R&D department of big ag, chemical and seed companies, giving them per plant intelligence they need to accelerate their own research. So Small Robot Company is the only startup building a robotic farming service for the world's largest crops. We've already done the hard work uh, and we're moving from prototypes into commercial delivery. Our per plant intelligence service is already live with customers in the UK and we're killing our first commercial weeds right now. So we've got a sophisticated IP strategy with UK and international umbrella patents in place and multiple sectional patents in the process of application. The core elements of our software and robotic platform have all been developed in-house by our team of 50. Uh, and we've got a robust customer pipeline in place. Three live, 40 starting in October, and 160 who have signed EOIs. Corporate R&D customers are also keen, uh, as one of the largest seed companies the world has already signed up, and we're in negotiation with several more seed and nutrient companies, as well as some of the world's most prestigious research organizations. Wilma and Tom are commercially deployed in limited numbers now, uh, and we're delivering per plant intelligence with them. Uh, we're also delivering immediate value through this integration with the farmer sprayers. Dick's precision application platform has been prototyped extensively over the last two years, and we're delivering limited commercial non-chemical weeding now, and we're targeting the rollout uh, later on this year. Harry's first trials were late last year, and we're looking to have that in place in the next couple of years. So what does it mean for farmers? Well, at the moment, farmers don't even know how many crop plants they have in the field, let alone ones that actually need nutrients. Uh, so by knowing each plant in the field, we can just target the ones that need it. Our calculations show this could reduce inputs by up to 90% not just blanketing their fields with uh, chemicals that also runs off into watercourses and creates dead zones and algal blooms and all the problems that we've heard about in the news. Sorry. 
Uh, we keep getting told that farmers need to blanket apply herbicides as well, but how do they know? They don't even know how many weeds are in the field or what species they are. So we watch as the weeds as they grow, we identify the species, uh, and then we build an intelligent project protection regime that just targets those um, that will actually limit yield potential. So by using spraying, we can reduce application rates by 80%. By using electricity, we can get rid of all chemicals. And we can even identify weeds that are previously thought impossible to differentiate from the crop, such as black grass in wheat, uh, uh, an over million euro problem in Europe alone. So pesticides tend to be applied prophylactically, just in case. No one really uh, has the capability of checking the crop often enough to be able to detect disease and pests when it first arrived just on a few plants and before it's had a chance to spread. So this leads to the environmental collapse that we hear so much about. And by checking each plant regularly and only treating the affected plants for disease or pests, we strip out the waste and also save the beneficial fungi and bacteria in the soil uh, and create more robust crop plants and support the pests' natural predators. All of this is achieved with, nat with lightweight vehicles that don't compact the soil. So this means the soil doesn't have to be ploughed. In fact, it's more healthy and supportive of crops if you don't. Uh, and this helps lock tons of carbon into the soil every year. And by radically reducing fertilizer use, the most carbon intensive part of arable farming, we can turn farmers from being the environmental bad boys into heroes. So this is what they call the fourth agricultural revolution, uh, a system co-designed by us and our customers to deliver the system that every farmer and corporate customer has been crying out for. So gone are the heavy vehicles, crushing and churning up the fields, mass applying chemicals where they needed or not. Uh, the fourth agricultural revolution uses light, precise, intelligent vehicles linked to per plant data that can finally allow regenerative farming to be delivered at scale. And for farmers, this just makes sense, right? We're increasing the yields closer to the theoretical maximum uh, and combining that with a reduction in input costs. So farms are profitable. And ultimately, we help farmers prepare for a future where farmers um, or chemicals will be used uh, as an exception rather than uh, as the rule, if at all. For corporate research teams, this allows them to build their holy grail, a digital twin of the field, data that's rich and granular enough that it can be converted into accurate, reliable, um, predictive models. This allows them to trial the impacts of new seeds or nutrients or protection in days rather than years. So we've done more in the last year than we've done in the previous four combined. So firstly, we've got a, a, a new revenue stream uh, with corporates and, and research institutes, and we've developed a new hybrid revenue model that co covers capital costs and reduces our costs of customer acquisition and extends our customer lifetime. So this has allowed us to increase our yield, uh, sorry, our um, revenue predictions uh, for the 22-23 season to around about three million pounds. Our, our service is, is faster, it's cheaper, and it's more reliable than it was last year. And sprayer integration is immediately available, so saving farmers to the tune of 200 pounds a hectare already. Our current robots are commercial, they're dependable and they're well tested, and our new robots are half the price, as well as being faster and more efficient. And Tom and Dick share 80% of the components with each other, so that makes our supply chains easier and cheaper. So my industry uh, comes, uh, my, sorry, my introduction to this comes from working for 20 years in the digital industry and working on the digital transformation of large companies um, and seeing how technology can radically rip up and change the model uh, for, for whole industries. Um, but particularly when I was working at Ordnance Survey, the UK's national mapping agency, which has the most detailed geospatial data in the world, I came to realize the potential of knowing exactly um, what was happening for each individual plant. And Sam, my um, business partner, has got a very deep knowledge of arable farming, being a fourth generation arable farmer, as well as working at Accenture. So together, we worked together to form this vision, and that scale of the vision has caught the eye of some of the best people in the industry. So we built a significant team from Dyson and DeepMind, JCB, IBM, and Virgin Galactic, uh, and most of them have approached us, and most of them have already personally invested in us. That's how much they believe in what we're doing. So we take our advice from people who've done it before, including Google's X and Starship, so we really understand the challenges of moving from concept to prototype to product to service and beyond. So there are lots of companies looking to build robots for farming, uh, but ultimately we're the only company bringing per-plant farming to the world's largest crops. 
And as we say, small is good. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Ben. Um, and also, like the last made statement, small is good. Uh, quite an impressive presentation of the robot army that you built there, if I can call it that. <laughs> maybe, you. maybe here as um, as a reminder for everyone joining, please, if you have any questions for Ben, ask them on Slido, because otherwise, I'll ask all my questions, and <laughs> then there's no time left for your questions. So please go ahead to Slido and ask them. So, Ben. When I was listening to you, I was trying to like imagine this this farm that of the future that you're kind of imagining. So, so how how is then like my everyday work as a farmer? Then, like, do I even have to go onto the field? Is like everything automated? Is there any manual task left? Any maintenance or the the boys? I'm I'm not sure if I remember their names. Tom, Dick. Tom, Dick, Harry, and Harry. Yeah. Praise, praise. Um, are they doing everything? So, so how can I imagine that? So um, what we are trying to do is really support farmers to be what they are, which is the, the managers or owners or directors of very large businesses. You know, in, in Europe, most of the farms are really multi-million pound or euro businesses. And the fact that farmers are forced at the moment to, to be the people who do the maintenance or the fixing or, or sort of driving the vehicles that, you know, the the, the, the quite dull sort of drudge work is, is actually taking away from their, their chance to be able to think about what their farm is as a business, what it means for the environment, um, how it fits within the local community. Um, so the way we see that it working is that we have uh, Toms who live on the farm. They have little kennels, um, which allow them to cover 200 hectares over a, a two week period. Um, and they're completely autonomous. At the moment, we take our Toms to the farm, but you know, our, we're working to um, provide complete autonomy. Uh, and um, at the moment, actually, what we're waiting for is uh, more clarification on the EU and uh, UK regulations around having autonomous vehicles in field uh, before we can really do that. But we've done the technical work to make that happen. Um, and then the key is that we take the Dick and Harry robots to the farm as and when it's necessary. So the farmer doesn't need to store those vehicles. You know, most vehicles on a farm you know, they get used maybe 5% of the time. You know, sprayers, they go out maybe sort of between five and 10 uh, times a year. Um, and, you know, that's very wasteful uh, in terms of machinery. And obviously while it's sitting there, it tends to rust and, and, and fall apart. Um, so that's why farmers have to do so much maintenance. So what we do by, by having this service, which is delivered to the farm is, is, you know, we can allow the farmers to get a really, really strong idea of what's working on their farm. So they can be a lot bolder uh, with things like experimenting with more um, uh, crop rotation, uh, with the idea of going back to a mixed farm rather than just a straight arable farm, you know, the use of things like cover crops, the use of uh, integrated pest management where you use, you know, beneficial um, uh, insects or, or biologicals or even um, uh, just the, the way that you're using things like cover crops to be able to control disease or weeds or pests um, and so that they're actually thinking about their farm in a really positive, um, uh, dynamic and proactive way. Um, at the moment, farmers, you know, they feel that they have to do a lot of this, this grunt work, which means that they have to, they don't have the time to be able to think about these things. And when we speak to our customers and all the people who approach us, when we talk about things like regenerative farming and the opportunities there, they say, well, you know, on top of everything else I do, it's too hard. You know, there are too many things I need to know. There's too much stuff. So by removing that, we're allowing them to be able to think about this. Okay. Um, and then I had one more question on, on, on your robot army. So how did, you, how did you narrow down that it has to be a Tom, a Dick, and a Harry, Jerry? <laughs> yeah. Harry. So, so, Harry. Yeah, Harry. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a, sorry, it's an English joke. Uh, Tom, Dick, Harry is like a... Uh, an expression in English, so any old Tom. Oh, okay, Dick, sorry, uh, I did not. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. So, no, no. Sorry. I was like, why is it not Tom and Jerry, right? <laughs> yeah, but no. But how how did you come up? Why is it not one robot that does all? Why is it those specific three? So uh, when Sam and I first started, and we saw the opportunity of sort of small autonomous vehicles in field, 
Um, we really got um, uh, excited ourselves about the idea, but we really wanted to know what farmers thought. So we went out to speak to farmers and we went to speak to them about the areas where they have the most concerns. Um, and one of those areas was around having sort of really usable data that actually allows them to change um, uh, what they're doing um, and which they couldn't get from drones, which they couldn't get from, uh, so in arable crops anyway, they couldn't get from satellite imagery because it's just not detailed enough or regular enough. Um, so, and then they were talking about the things that, you know, they, they were very concerned about um, um, sort of precision spraying. So they really wanted to be able to only spray in areas that were needed, partially from an environmental perspective, but also because it costs so much money. Uh, and as we've seen, you know, the cost of nutrient application, for example, has gone up three times in the last, you know, it's three times greater now than it was a year ago. Um, and then the final one was around planting. So, mm. you know, sort of um, a lot of farmers were interested in the idea of zero till and moving away from ploughing. Um, mm. But they wanted to have clarity and assurance that it was going to work um, because a lot of the zero till methods at the moment, um, there's a risk associated with them. Uh, and it's still not, it's not very precise. Uh, so, you know, so those are the areas that we focused on, delivering on what the farmers wanted. They didn't want us to do harvesting. Um, they, that was like one of the key areas they wanted us to avoid. Um, but the, the other areas they wanted to do. So we developed, um, you know, it's great to be able to develop something from the ground up, right? Not tied to a tractor model or anything like that. Um, and so we looked at, well, what's the best way for us to collect data? And we weren't tied to ground robots when we did that. What's the best way to collect data? What's the best way to uh, precision apply? Uh, and what's the best way to plant? And we've worked that out into these sort of three robots with this sort of um, architecture, the, this, this brain sitting over the top to be able to direct them uh, as the most efficient way to do that. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. So I see there's already a couple of questions coming in. So that's good that not only I, I uh, not my questions are answered. So first one is, could you explain the methods for pest management with your robots? Certainly. So um, the pest management um, is really at, right now um, is us being able to see where pest damage is happening. So we are focusing at the moment on wheat crops uh, and the uh, the main pests are around aphids and they sort of um, uh, inject disease into the plants and, and cause that to happen. And the other one is around slugs. They're the sort of the main pests. Now, we have worked with uh, a couple of um, significant uh, research organizations in the UK to develop a precision targeting and application system for slugs. It's, a, it's been in the press, it's called Slugbot. In fact, it was voted the weirdest invention of the last 20 years by a website recently. Um, but that allows us to be able to target slugs uh, and, and kill those. Um, but ultimately, what we want to do is to apply integrated pest management um, techniques. And those are around, uh, say, the use of cover crops and the reintroduction of the, the um, predators that kill those pests. You know, so with aphids, um, that's, you know, the reintroduction of spiders. Um, so reducing the amount of pesticides you use allows for spiders to, to be able to, to, to repopulate the field. Um, and also by providing cover, um, then it allows things like uh, karyatic beetles um, and uh, um, snakes to be able to take out the slugs because they love slugs. It's a brilliant meal for them. So what we are doing is um, we're pulling at the moment together a, a consortium in the UK of all the experts who understand regenerative farming. And we are going for a bid, a, a long-term bid, to be able to quantify the methodologies of regenerative farming and particularly integrated pest management so that we can basically remove the need for the application of anything as much as possible and just be there to treat it when something has gone wrong uh, and you need just that judicious uh, use of a, a biological or, or even chemical pesticide or, or fungicide uh, to resolve it. Okay, the slug bot. I need to check that later. The <laughs> invention. Um, so we have two more questions uh, also on the economics. So I think about after all the excitement for the robots, I guess that's a good question to ask. So how many units would a farmer require on their farms? Is there a calculation? Um, so um, we uh, work on a sort of 200 hectare um uh area essentially so the tom can cover 200 hectares it can cover 200 hectares now 
uh, over the course of two weeks. Um, that will increase over time as reliability and efficiency goes up, etc. But but at the moment we're looking at 200 hectares, and then we work out our you know our response using Dick and Harry around those 200 hectares as well. So we can work on a farm as small as 200 hectares, um, or we can expand that up modularly to cover 2,000 or 20,000 hectares as necessary. You know, ultimately it's a per hectare cost, um, and there are savings of being able to apply that to a bigger scale. Um, but ultimately, it's a sort of a, a unit cost. Mm -hmm. okay. So I think that already answers also the second question. So minimum farm size is then... Well, so so on that note, though, what we've... Um, so the new model that we're working on that I mentioned in our presentation, um, we have, you know, these uh, 35 farmers who prepaid for our service in the UK. And they are some of the most influential farmers in the UK. So, you know, the NFU Farmer of the Year, um, the, um, uh, the ex-head of the Oxford Farming Conference, um, you know, we're very closely tied with some really um, uh, important and well-respected people. Um, and what that uh, has allowed us to do is to ask them to recruit farmers around them. Because no farmer will just say, I want you to take over my whole 200 hectares or 1,000 hectares, whatever, straight away. They will say, test it on this field. Let's see if it works. And that tends to be about 20 hectares. So what we are doing is now getting those farmers to recruit other farmers around them so that we can deliver Tom to cover 200 hectares across, you know, four, eight, ten mm -hmm. farms uh, and then prove the point with them and then expand that. So actually, there isn't a minimum size of farm that we can work with, um, providing that um, that farm is part of a, a, a pod, you know, which is very similar to the uh, the cooperative models um, that Alan was talking about earlier with with, with farmers in Africa. Okay, well, it sounds sounds great because I mean, also in in Austria, I guess the, the which is rather small structure, then that's that's also a way to to go around to to, to build those groups. Yeah, exactly. So I, I guess we talked too much about the, the slugs. So now there's a question on how do robots eliminate slugs? Lasers, mechanical arms? Ben, how do you do it? <laughs> it's it's uh, slightly less um, exciting than that. So what we're actually doing is using a biological treatment that is already in market for, um, for, for uh, gardeners. Um, and that biological um, um, uh, treatment is, uh, uses nematode worms. Uh, and those nematode worms, when they're applied on or near the slug, um, give the slug irritable bowel syndrome, basically, uh, to, to the extent where the slug dies. Uh, and then, that's, then, then that slug then just rots into the soil. So there's no chemicals involved. It is just using a biological control to do it. But previously, that biological control has been too expensive to mass apply in field. Um, and in fact, the only chemicals that are working now for um, people who have a slug problem are terrible for the environment. You know, if you have too much of, um, uh, of the slug chemical leaching into the local water supply and there is a water purification plant on that river, um, that water purification plant has to be shut down for a week. Um, because it cannot get into the, the human food supply. It's terrible, terrible stuff. So, you know, um, using biologicals and just applying it to the slug um, massively reduces the amount of liquid that's being used. And because it's a, a biological, it's also completely um, uh, sort of nature friendly. Okay. Sounds exciting. Um, there's one more question we just received, and I think we still have time for it. Um, can you elaborate how your robots deal with nematodes? Is it via heat? How is it done on a large scale? And what kind of nematodes can you fight? So um, nematodes in soil, um, we uh, haven't um, looked at being able to solve at the moment. It's not a huge problem uh, in uh, small grain arable crops that we're dealing with in Europe. Um, a lot of the problems that happen with nematodes tend to be caused through an imbalance in the soil. Um, so, you know, a, a predilection of a particular sort of nematode, which will cause, you know, damage to the roots or, or something like that in, in corn or soy, for example, tends to be because that soil is massively out of balance, um, uh, which means that the natural predators to those nematodes don't exist. Um, so um, we are not looking specifically to treat nematodes. Um, what we are focusing on is improving the soil health and the balance of the biome of the soil 
uh, mm. to be able to balance those out. Because it's one of the big things around regenerative farming that, you know, these things that, such as nematodes, which have really only come up in the last 20 years or so as being a huge problem, is because those soils are massively tired, they're drained of nutrients, they're missing the bacteria and the fungi they need, and they don't have that balance to be able to um, uh, support and counter uh, things like um, uh, um, damaging nematodes in the soil. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for, for answering all the questions that we now did receive in the end. Uh, and thanks again for your presentation. And yeah, um, yeah, great that we could have you, Ben. Absolute pleasure, Pia. If anybody wants to contact me, uh, it's very simple. My email address is ben at smallrobotcompany.com um, or um, just look me up on LinkedIn and I will happily answer any further questions. So uh, no problems at all. Or if you still have some B2 match slots available, that's also always a, a way to go to get in touch. So feel free to also reach out to Ben via our Absolutely. B2 match platform. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. So um, next up, we have table robots, although we need to check if they're already online and ready to speak. So maybe we'll have a short um, video in between. Um, Clemens, Matthias, can you help me out there? Yes, we, yes. video time it is. We still have to onboard uh, the next speaker. So we will play a video loop until the next one. Thank you. So see you. Perfect. And yeah, we are back with the announcement for our next speaker. As Pia before has uh, already mentioned, we, we started with robots on the ground. Now it's going into the air, like a couple of centimeters higher. Uh, yeah, Pia, tell us a bit more about our next speaker. Yeah, I have to say, I've, I've watched the, when I heard there's already flying robots that are used also commercially, I had to watch their video, I think two times already picking fruit um, flying in the air. So I'm quite excited to, to welcome Itai Marom, who is the CEO of Table Aerorobotics Technologies. They're based in Israel. And yeah, happy to welcome Itai on stage. Hi. Uh, good Hello. morning, good evening to whoever is uh, uh, logging in from elsewhere. But uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, as I said, I'm I'm a big fan of your of your flying robots as far as I can be from just watching different videos for, on YouTube. <laughs> did, did you bring any today? Did you are they flying around? Uh, yeah, so there's in the in the slide deck there's uh there's one video. Um, I I try to not use too many videos over uh, you know online media because it tends to uh, stream differently on everybody's uh, computers. But I, I, hope the, uh, I hope my session will be uh, as interesting as the videos you saw on YouTube. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Clemens, are we ready for Itai's presentation? Otherwise, I could say just 
stage? Uh, not, 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 not yet. Uh, please, could you share your slides so we can put them on the stage? Yes. Here it goes. Yeah, and as usual, if there are any questions, uh, please write them to the Slido and not to the P2Match chat. So yeah, this, it, it's easier to have everything in one place. Yeah, Just, here it uh, goes. Confirm and, that you see that. Yeah, here it goes and there it comes. Excellent. The stage is yours. So see you later. Thank you. So uh, again, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, the presentation. Since this is a this is a forum on on, on AI, um, I'll I'll share a bit about what we do in general and, and why we're here. But most of the slide deck is is focused on on AI. So uh, hopefully, uh, if there are any questions, we can address them uh, later in the uh, uh, Q and A session. So diving in, um, why we're here and what we're here to solve. So Tevel. As mentioned, we're located in Israel. Uh, we've been around for about uh, four or five years. And why we're here is simple. There's a global uh, challenge or a global uh, problem, and it involves uh, labor. There aren't enough uh, fruit pickers worldwide. Uh, it, uh, uh, it doesn't even have to do simply with uh, fruit picking. You can see it in agriculture everywhere. Uh, it has to do with global trends, but basically um, more and more land is being used for agriculture and also for, uh, for fruit growing. It has to do with uh, the demand for healthier uh, food, but generally as more and more land is used worldwide for labor, uh, less and less people want to be involved in the manual labor of picking it, among other manual labors in, in agriculture. So you have more and more land growing fruit and less and less people willing uh, uh, to pick it. Um, and this is global. The problem is global. And most places you go, uh, fruit pickers are uh, migrant labors. So they come in from different countries across borders. Obviously, a global pandemic like the one we're in for the past two years exacerbated uh, the situation. And putting all that aside, the entire orchard operations are a massive burden on uh, growers. So apart from their problem in getting pickers and recruiting them for the harvesting season and holding on to them and paying them uh, uh, the uh, increasing uh, uh, labor costs, it's, it's a massive burden uh, in terms of the operation. So it's uh, machinery, it's facilities, it's housing, it's healthcare, it's visas, it's overhead, it's uh, you name it. Just in the picture here, you can see uh, 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 more than a dozen uh, fruit picking platforms with more than uh, four uh, uh, pickers on each. You can see housing in the, in the background, uh, transportation, it's a, it's a thing. Um, and our solution, and I won't go into too much detail in this slide, uh, autonomous fruit picking flying robots. It's a system uh, that consists of the basic kit is four, in the future we'll get to more than that. So four uh, tethered robots to a ground unit uh, picking uh, the fruit. The ground unit includes a bin and the fruits are being picked autonomously by the robots, uh, put on the platform and the platform does the uh, uh, collection of the fruits and and puts them in the bin without getting too much into this solution because i'm on a tight time frame here i want to dive a bit into the ai and if there are any other questions we can uh, address them when i finish um, so basically the really the core of the system is is ai uh, that's when we uh when we look at the solution we uh we built we take a lot of pride in the AI because that's really what uh, runs everything in the background. So um, it has to do with fruit detection and fruit classification and even disease detection. We detect obstacles, the uh, flying robots uh, sense external forces, and I'll detail that in a minute. 
and the system autonomously picks or selects the right fruit every time. Uh, it has to do with uh, deep neural networks, and they're all working simultaneously during the harvest. So there's no, uh, uh, everything works in parallel while we harvest, so the data collected is collected all the time. And uh, this also, uh, the, the, the wide range of data enables us to work on uh, different kinds of fruits. I'll, I'll um, show that a little later. Uh, we also do color grading of the fruits we uh, identify. So uh, uh, this is done in cooperation with uh, our customers. And the most important thing I think in this slide, and you'll see it a bit later again, and everybody in the fruit picking business understands that, um, we are able to offer selective picking. Meaning that when you go into an orchard and uh, many types of fruits uh, are being harvested selectively, meaning that uh, you don't get an orchard which ripens at the same day, at the same hour. And since uh, the uh, revenue that a farmer gets off of their uh, fruits is dependent on the fruit quality, uh, in many cases, they pick selectively, meaning they go into the orchard on day one of the harvest and harvest X percent of fruit and then wait a few days and pick the second stage of, of picking, which uh, involves fruit that weren't ripe a few days before, but are now ripe. That is something that human pickers do today, and our system does that as well. So diving in a little bit into any uh, every, uh, every stage here. So first, uh, uh, fruit detection. Now this is done. Uh, with continuous data collection. So basically, it's a lot of data we gathered through the uh, past uh, five years. Uh, we annotate it, and this enables a wide range of fruits and varieties. What you see here is a picture from the eyes of the robot itself, the uh, depth camera and the uh, on the robot. This is what it sees, and you can see how it uh, um, distinguishes between fruits. So that's, let's say, level one. That's really the base layer of identifying the fruits on the on the trees and uh, the next level is a much deeper level and it really has to do with a lot of ai um, once you identify all the fruits every fruits get every fruit gets a location or an address on the tree and apart from that we uh we can uh, today sense uh the size and the color and based on these two factors, we make the decision, or we can allow the system to make the decision on ripeness. And uh, what you saw, I'll play the video again, if you missed it, these are peaches. And what you see here are color grades and size grades that the system autonomously gives each and every fruit. So you see that uh, some of the fruits uh, get a grade of four or three or two, in this specific instance, we had five color grades and the system was programmed to pick everything which is four and above. So although it identifies everything, it makes the decision on picking only four and five because that's what this specific farmer uh, asked for. Moving on to, uh, to a much deeper level, and that is disease detection. So the system today already uh, can uh, identify uh, with, uh, uh, with a very large data set that we train it on, um, certain, uh, I would say, diseases or damages that uh, fruits uh, that we uh, collected uh, uh, suffer from. What's interesting about it is that first it's customizable. So what you see here are diseases that apples in Israel are uh, uh, usually suffering from. But when we go to Italy and pick fruits there, they have different types of diseases. And what's nice about this feature is that you can customize it. So all we need is a, is a bunch of pictures of, of apples which suffer from, let's say, hail damage, which is common in certain parts of uh, Italy. And we can train the system to identify these. And this gives uh, a ton of value uh, to a grower because this allows what we call sorting at the source. 
So imagine that uh, you have a machine, you have a robot that not only uh, can pick selectively and pick only the right ripe fruit, it can also uh, detect the damaged fruit and either pick it if you want it because you know we can uh, sort it uh, in the packing house and sell it for uh, juice or throw it to the ground or put it in a different bin. And this all amounts to a ton of data. I'll get to it uh, in a minute. Uh, but imagine you can do all this at the source in the orchard, which is something unheard of today in the fruit picking industry. These are all things that today growers get only in the packing house. Some, sometimes some of these diseases infect a full bin of fruits. So the fact that you can come in and say, hey, I picked apple number 932 in location XYZ and it had this and this disease is invaluable to a grower. Uh, next, next is, uh, is the ability to uh, detect obstacles. Uh, you can see that this picture is a bit different than the one you saw at the beginning. This is a much, uh, I would say, more advanced uh, detection of fruits. This is what uh, we call segmentation. It uh, detects uh, the fruits and uh, the obstacles on the way. So this enables us first to understand if there's an obstacle on the way to a, to a fruit. And, um, and second, it allows us um, to make a better decision on what fruits to pick first and what second, and so on. And finally comes the uh, fruit selection. So based on everything you saw by, uh, by now, this allows us uh, to, uh, to choose the right target. And there's a whole bunch of target management uh, tools and tracking tools that we use because um, just making sure you can still hear me, I think uh, some network problems here. We can still hear you very well. Um, okay. So that's, that's fine. Okay, cool. So, um, so this might seem very, very easy, but uh, keep in mind that what you see here in the red box, which is the specific apple that the system autonomously chose to pick at this point, is a six by six, seven by seven centimeter target. And we have a flying robot that needs to get uh, and attach to it precisely. So uh, this involves uh, a neural network of tracking. And as I said, this uh, enables the decision on, on selective picking, on which apple is ripe and which one we should pick. Um, next. This is a cool feature, or uh, or even more than a feature. Um, our algorithms enable the sensing of external forces. And with a flying robot, this isn't, uh, I would say, shouldn't be taken lightly. Uh, we have a flying robot which actually engages with the foliage. You'll see a video later, but it actually flies into the tree and outside of the tree. And with our algorithms, uh, uh, the, the robots detect uh, obstacles, understand if they're, uh, if they're coping with high winds. And what is especially interesting here is that after harvest, when the fruit is at the gripper, uh, at the tip of the uh, arm, it uh, measures using moments and, and advanced algorithms, it measures the size and the weight of the fruit picked. So essentially, what we uh, the value we bring to the grower here is the ability. I I talked uh, two minutes uh, earlier about this. You have specific apple or other fruit uh, in location X Y Z. You give it a grade. You give it a size, and then when after you pick it, uh, uh, you recheck uh, your uh, numbers and give a pretty accurate. Uh, a number on its uh, size and weight. And then uh, when it rolls down into the bin, you can give e each bin a total number of fruits and weight, which is again, unheard of in the industry today. Today, a grower knows the uh, yield of, its, of his, his or her harvest only when the season is done, when all the bins 
were offloaded into the packing house and collected and analyzed and blah, blah, blah uh, at the end of the process. We are offering something here that is at the source in real time during harvest, which is, which is pretty uh, revolutionary. Um, also, night harvest is something that's usually not done today with pickers. Uh, this is something that our uh, data and algorithms enable because lighting environments were, uh, were pretty agnostic to them. So uh, doing ha harvest at night is something that we're already doing and, and is practically a reality now. And I said that we can cope with different types of fruits. These are pictures uh, showing that. So today we're into picking apples and different kinds of stone fruit. You can see here peaches and apricots and nectarines and plums. And that's this is enabled directly by AI. The hardware remains the same. Nothing changes in the robot. Uh, you just have a different uh, data set of, uh, uh, of fruits. And the system takes off today, picks apricots, takes off tomorrow, and picks apples. Uh, as simple as that. Final slides. So uh, the output we provide here, again, this goes to what I uh, touched on, on sorting at the source and, and giving data on real time. This is actually an output of the system of how many fruits you picked at a certain time of the day, uh, what's the weight, uh, different uh, distribution tables. So say you can tell the grower, hey, on the distribution of sizes is 85 millimeters in this specific bin which again is something that uh, they don't have today. It's something they have only uh, retrospective. So there's a ton of metrics that uh, we can uh, offer with uh, data and data and more data that is collected uh, during harvest. Um, and I'm closing with a video because Pia asked. Um, this is from our recent uh, commercial pilot we did in October in uh, Italy with uh, a uh, very large uh, grower, uh, a company called the uh, Revoya Group. Um, this is a, a pilot we did with them for about a few weeks. Uh, we picked uh, uh, we picked Fuji apples uh, for them in a very strong uh, cooperation. Uh, we uh, spent day in day out in the orchard picking fruits. Every bin we picked went immediately to their packing house. Uh, a day later, we received feedback from their packing house on our performance. This really allowed us to understand how our grading is done, how our ripeness decisions are, are being done. And, uh, and above all, we were able to uh, demonstrate that machine or that our flying robots uh, pick the fruit at the same quality or higher than human pickers uh, because we worked you see this row of apples and the row in parallel was a row where pickers picked uh, the apples for uh, this grower and at the end of the day we supplied bins they supplied bins uh, the performance was compared and um, the conclusion was that uh, our system picks at least at the same quality as human pickers, sometimes even better. And more importantly, uh, it's consistent every time. Now, um, without wasting too much time on what we did here, I can uh, narrate the, the, the video a, a little and you can see that uh, the system isn't perfect yet because you can see that not you know, every fruit that you uh, that the robot gets to uh, is is picked, or so they they encounter some obstacles. But you can see that the system is fully autonomous; nobody's controlling it. And what's interesting to see is that each robot makes a decision per fruit uh, independently. So you can see that uh, uh, in this uh, in this case, it uh, it got to this uh, specific apple, uh, couldn't uh, pick it and just retreats and goes back to try another one or use a different angle you, like you see here, detects, uh, detected an obstacle and comes in from a different angle. Uh, so this can go on for minutes and minutes. 
just I'll quickly here, Itai, because the video quality is, as you as you said, yeah. not the best. So we can supply the link of the video afterwards, and everybody can have a cool. Look. So this is exactly my last slide. Uh, this is where we are today. I promised I'll, I'll touch on it. Uh, so we did our first commercial pilot uh, successfully. Um, our selective picking was uh, uh, was proven uh, to yield consistent results uh, better than uh, human pickers. We're continuing our commercial harvest this year, both in Europe and in the United States with a few select customers. If there are uh, US-based uh, um, listeners here, although it's uh, the the hour is, is a bit early in the US will be uh, beginning of February, we'll be uh, demoing our, our system in California in the World Ag Expo. So anyone there, come meet us in the booth. Uh, we're collaborating with local platform manufacturers because uh, in order to uh, provide a wide portfolio of, of harvesting uh, uh, equipment, uh, we're uh, aiming to integrate our flying kit on existing uh, uh, platforms. So that's part of our strategy here. So we'll co we're collaborating with some of these. And in general, this, the, the company has raised over $30 million in funding till now. And we're about to open another investment round this year. Uh, so 2022 is a very exciting year for us. And again, thank you for having me. And any questions, I'm here. Thanks so much, Itai. Um, we actually already received a couple of questions. Um, and I think we should have them, although we're a bit behind time. So apparently, I'm not the only fan from Austria of your robots. So um, Christian Knaus asked via the B2B mat uh, match platform, when will your technology be in use in Europe and especially in Austria and it, if it can be rented? Yeah, so our our technology is already in use in Europe. So uh, as I said, we completed our first commercial uh, pilot in Italy. We'll be in Italy next year too for many months. And please reach out. I know uh, driving from Austria down to Italy is easy, but I hope we'll get to Austria soon. But if you want to see our system in action, take the car and meet us in uh, in Italy. Okay, thanks. Maybe we have time for one more. So does this work for avocados as well? So avocados mm -hmm. is definitely a, a target for us, uh, hopefully in the coming uh, year or two. Uh, we know the same obstacles, the same problem in labor is in avocado and definitely avocado is in the crosshairs of our in, in our roadmap okay um maybe a quick answer to the last question that we have so how many photos do you need to adapt uh, your disease detection model to disease specific um, or other regions yeah I, I see the question sorry uh, for interrupting um yeah the easy uh, uh it's easy it's uh you know, it can be, let's say, a few hundred photos, but the, why, why do I say it's easy? Because that's somewhere where we cooperate with packing houses. So getting pictures from packing houses is one way, to, uh, uh, one way to speed up the process, but it's relatively easy. Okay. And how, do you, how quickly can you change from one fruit type to another? Can you detect the fruit and perform the picking even in orchards with various fruits? So I don't know of orchards with various fruits i mean a tree can have one fruit but uh it's easy it's uh i would i would say it's a matter of minutes okay wow sounds amazing well it's a thanks so much for for your presentation and answering your questions and if anyone has any other questions uh you can reach out to him via the b2b b2 match platform um yeah so happy. thank you very much Good yeah, luck thank you. rest of the day. Great. And um, as a next, uh, we are happy to um, get on the stage Adi Nir, um, also from Israel. He's the CEO of, of Meto Motion. And we are going from at first we started on the ground. Now we had robots flying in the air. And uh, now we're going to the robots that are acting in the greenhouse. So we are very happy to hear Adi Nia's take on uh, yeah, his robots in the greenhouse. Hi, Adi. Hello, good morning, everyone. 
Hello, good morning. Um, yeah, I think as we're already a bit behind time, I would say the stage is yours. And yeah, please start your presentation and we'll see each other afterwards in the Q&A. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, so my name is Adi and I'm the CEO of Metamotion. So I saw the previous presentation talking about flying robots and now we're going into the greenhouse. And this is what we are doing here in Metamotion. Uh, we're developing uh, a robotic platform for greenhouses. Um, and you've probably heard about it in previous lectures. Uh, labor shortage is one of the global issues that farmers is facing today. With growing population, growing demand for healthy food, and uh, but agriculture, like other disciplines, is suffering from uh, a very uh, significant labor shortage. If you take it into a greenhouse, then the labor cost can reach up to 50% of the production cost. What we are doing here in Metamotion is developing a platform uh, for especially designed for greenhouse to perform uh, labor intensive tasks in the greenhouse. Our first focus was on harvesting of greenhouse tomatoes. Uh, but in the future, we will offer more and more services. Uh, the idea is to save labor, of course, and solve the, the labor crisis issue and reduce costs. I would like to show you now Grow. This is how we call it, Greenhouse Robotic Worker. This is the platform that we have developed. It's an autonomous vehicle designed for the greenhouse environment. It can drive on the ground or on rails like you have in a greenhouse. Uh, it can work in a people or human environment uh, safely. It has two robotic arms, so we can work on both sides. You know, in our greenhouse, we have very narrow rows of the crop and you can drive throughout the, uh, the greenhouse. Uh, so we have two arms, each one of the arms works in, in, a, in each side, a 3D vision system uh, that looks at uh, connected to each one of the sides. And since we're harvesting tomatoes and we're the high yield, we also have an onboard boxing unit. And of course, inside, we have all the computing uh, system equipped with AI-based software. I will show you now a short video. I hope it will work uh, good about our system and how it looks in the field. This is where we put all the fruit that we are harvesting on a trailer that we carry behind the robot. This is all also allows us to work continuously day and night 24 seven. So this was our robot and this is how it works. Uh, when you drive through the greenhouse, you see a lot of features, obstacles, and you need to know your way inside. So we have designed specifically our system to detect each one of the, of the fruits, decide on its ripeness level, perform 3D mapping of the environment, detect obstacles, so you can reach very accurately and harvest without damaging 
the fruits or the plants or or the system itself because you see there's a lot of other things inside the greenhouse uh, so in this uh, very complex environments we're using AI based software uh, to actually learn our way inside and perform complicated tasks inside the greenhouse The system actually uh, learns a lot about the environment and knows a lot, a lot of things. Uh, and since if you talk about tomatoes, you have thousands of varieties, uh, different sizes, colors, uh, structures of vines and clusters. Uh, and so the, our system is designed that it can easily be adapted. And we actually let the grower decide, since he's the expert, what is his uh, criteria for for harvesting ripeness level size if you want to give exceptions all different kind of parameters uh, I heard my colleague before about how to adapt the system for different crops so if we meet a new variety or a new crop uh, the system is designed so we can easily adapt adapt it to different kind of, uh, of vegetables uh, all we need to do is collect data and then train the system that it can recognize uh, the new variety or uh, the new vegetable. We talked about how robots inside the greenhouse helped helping to solve the labor crisis uh, and reduce the cost. But this is not the only thing. What we are doing is we are using the huge amounts of data that we are collecting uh, to help the growers improve the quality, improve the yield. Because in a greenhouse, usually it's a selective harvesting. It means that uh, you, you go throughout uh, the greenhouse and pick the fruits every week or even twice a week, but pick only the ripe fruits. Um, and you do this process almost year round. Uh, so every few days you come again and again to the same area and pick the, the ripe fruits using the data that we are collecting and we are actually knows exactly where we are located inside the greenhouse. Uh, we can give a lot of information and analyze it. How many, what is the yield in each one of the locations? What is the yield forecast? Okay, how many we will, we will have next week or the week after that? And we can indicate about stressed area and improve the control. So it's ju not just about replacing labor, it's a whole new way of thinking using this data uh, for doing various of things. We can also use third party uh, users that can act do other tasks with our data. Uh, everything is actually collected and then we uh, synchronize it with our cloud application, then the grower can actually sit in his office and learn exactly what's happening inside his greenhouse. Um, we did a, a, quite a lot of research with our uh, customers, partner, future customers, uh, learned uh, the financial models. So robotics is not just technolo technology, it brings a lot of value for the growers. As we mentioned before, solving the, the labor shortage, which became even worse those days with the COVID uh, and traveling limitation that made things even worse. Uh, what we see is that the payback we're talking about is in under two years and our eyes above 500%. Uh, so the financial value is real and it's there. Uh, and it, it's not just new technology, it's an answer to a real need of the farmers. If you look at the market of the, or global market of harvesting robot, what you see is that as we spoke before, uh, the need is there with growing population, growing demand from one side and with limited uh, available uh, labor 
to doing that task. So technology is there and the motivation is always getting higher. So we're this market is growing pretty pretty fast and is expect, expected to grow even faster uh, in the next few years uh, with solutions like you saw from Tavel and from Metamotion and other companies you probably see on this session today. What are our plans uh, in Metamotion? So uh, we're going to launch our first application, which is the tomato uh, harvesting robot this year. We already have a few installations in Europe uh, and planning to expand this year. Uh, and in the future, in the near future, we're going to offer more and more services to our uh, prospective customers like different crops inside the greenhouse and different and doing different tasks. A little bit about our first target market or where are we starting? So we are starting with the high tech sector of greenhouses where different kind of greenhouses uh, depended on different conditions and uh, economic parameters. We are starting from the high tech sector of greenhouses focusing on the tomatoes, on vine tomatoes. The tomatoes are actually more than one third of the total industry of uh, vegetable greenhouses. A little bit more information about the company. So the company is now a few years old. Uh, it received a prize from Israeli Ministry of Agriculture for a first prize for innovation in robotics and also support from the European Commission Horizon 2020 program and the Israeli Innovation Authority. Among our partners, uh, you can actually find the Trainlines Group, uh, Reader, which is an greenhouse, uh, a Dutch greenhouse technology provider, Navis, which is uh, also a Dutch company for milking robots, and the Technion Accelerator, uh, the Israeli Technological University. Our team is very multidisciplinary team from different occupation as needed in robotics and agriculture, but we're all very passionate and professional. Um, this is about it. All I wanted to tell you today. I hope it was interesting and I'm here if you have any questions or you wish to meet me later after this meeting. Uh, we haven't done anything in Austria yet, but if there's interest, we will be very, very happy uh, to also enter into Austria and bring our first system to Austria. If you yeah, have any questions, so I'm... yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, really, really exciting to see uh, what what is possible already with robots, also in greenhouses. Um, I think we had uh, two more questions that we received that we want to quickly go through. Um, so yeah, I think the first one you touched, is it already operational in Europe? So you're only saying about Austria, so how about Europe? Um, yeah, we, we started our first commercial steps. Okay, we're now starting officially. The product is not launched yet, but hopefully in the next few months. So we only have a number of sites uh currently uh in the netherlands um second second question i see it's about the harvesting speed yeah um, harvesting speed currently it's uh it's more or less the same speed as a human but it depends how you measure it if you run 100 meters probably the human can still win the robot but if it's a marathon or a whole day then uh, the robot will win for sure uh, because we can work for many, many hours, uh, longer shifts or even night time, uh, no lunch breaks, uh, no quarantine. Um, so, um, and it will improve and improve through time. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Adi, for your presentation and also your answers to the Q&A. And yeah, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, IR via B2Match, um, yeah, um, exactly. You can reach out to Adi. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Adi.
So we have a quick change in uh, the moderation here now. So Matthias uh, will be taking over. And um, yeah, so this was it from my side. And wish you all lots of fun and interesting talks still at the conference. <laughs> Thanks so much, Pia. And we'll be seeing you again a little bit later. And we stay on the topic of the age of robots, which is uh, quite fascinating and I think one of the most interesting parts of this two-day conference that we organize here. And uh, we tackle upon the question, um, why is AI important to agriculture? And thus, I am very happy to welcome with me on stage uh, from the Federal Institute of Education and Research, Francisco Josefinum, Mr. Heinrich Prankel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello, Matthias, I can hear you clearly. I hope you too. Yes, wonderful and perfect. I see we already have your slides here and we look forward to hear from you as you are a specialized institution training, not only farmers and agriculture experts, but also data scientists. So we are right uh, with you on the topic and here are your slides. And I would say the, the, the stage is yours for a couple of minutes. And don't forget to post your questions as this is a live event <laughs> and we will be seeing each other for the Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Pia and Matthias. Uh, congratulations to the conference because uh, it was so uh, interesting to, 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 to have a look on the presentations before. I'm really looking uh, ahead to ask myself if I can contribute with any further information because so many things uh, were done. What I could recognize is that uh, there are so many young people uh, diving into that new, let me say, technological branch. And that's uh, important for the so named digital natives because uh, it is a challenging uh, technology. When I speak uh, to my digital native daughter and uh, ask her, uh, tell her when she's uh, working or, or playing with her, her smartphone, I ask her, yes, um, uh, dear daughter, th there has been a life before the smartphones. Uh, she is replying and uh, looking in my eyes and she tells me, father, maybe there have been a time before smartphones, but that wasn't really a life. Yes. Uh, that's the beginning of my presentation. I want to start with um, with um, a, um, I want to start with a citation of a um, historian and philosopher and Israeli uh, Yuval Harari, who mentioned artificial intelligence and bioengineering, which will change our evolution. And I think uh, he is totally right, and I'm convinced that that too technologies uh, will uh, significantly change our life. But before I want to mention who we are, uh, Francisco Josefinum is the biggest school in Austria, educating in uh, four divisions, agricultural, agricultural engineering, food biotechnology, and uh, very, uh, very uh, recently we have a, a new um, division, information technology in agriculture, but you also can study uh, make your bachelor in digital farming here uh, at our institute. I'm responsible for the right side for the um, research and testing uh, facility and our uh, our competences, our core competences are from a, let me see, um, agricultural point of view. That's uh, the typical uh, branches, tillage and seeding, fertilization, crop protection, crop protection, a little bit harvesting, grassland management and so on. And from the technological point of view, we are working, uh, we are dealing with uh, mechatronics and robotics, with data sciences, with computer vision, and of course, with artificial intelligence, uh, summarized as digital farming, maybe. So, um, and we are doing uh, one uh, further point or one further project. We, um, we are uh, operating the um, uh, so named innovation farm where we present or where we investigate and uh, demonstrate new technologies and uh, new things uh, which are very interesting and bring them, bring them further to the market. That's, I think, important. So if we have a look uh, to what are innovative uh, technologies in agriculture, and we can see 
yes, there we have already amongst traditional machines and traditional systems, we have increasing uh, systems, electronic components on machines, uh, software available, and uh, 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 even uh, remote sensing from uh, satellites. And uh, if we look to machines, yes, we have already very high sophisticated technologies like um, auto guidance systems. We have, uh, um, um, we have, um, yes, um, remote sensing, and we have um, also a, a control machine control, uh, remote machine control systems. So it is uh, very. Uh, uh, we are. I would like to say we are very uh, far developed remote sensing to have a look on the crop vegetation from, um, from satellites. We can observe uh, the development of our vegetation from satellites and gain data in order to make a better and more precise, um, uh, 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 more precise um, things for, for our crops to increase our uh, efficiency. And on the side of animal husbandry, we can see that we have uh, milking robots, which are uh, currently state, state of the art. We have uh, systems for health monitoring, for herd monitoring, for uh, animal location, supervising them. So there is much progress in the last years. And the, thing, the question is, why do we do that? And why, uh, what, is, what are the consequences? Uh, what is the reason behind the reason behind is that is there, there is no no product and it, it, even it is very small small product which doesn't have any uh, component any electronic component and a connection to to a, a server anywhere where uh, a, we where it puts data uh, to be frank uh, the databases are in most cases independently from each other so we cannot use uh, we can um, it is uh, it is uh, it is difficult to use uh, a, a, a broad picture of, of what we are doing, but nevertheless, uh, we have many, many, many uh, electronic components, and what we produce is data. That might might, might be an interesting picture for a data sign. This it's not a beautiful picture for me because it, I'm not um, happy about data. I'm happy about information. Yes, and information are, I think, the important issue if I want to increase the process and if I want to get more efficiently, if I want to uh, improve myself uh, from an ecological but also from economical point of view. And now we have a new, um, let me say, a new area because robots are appearing and we have the technology of artificial intelligence. And I would rise, like to raise the question, is it a game changer? Um, we have evaluated um, more than 150 uh, robot projects uh, recently. Um, of course, many of them are um, um, initiated by um, universities, by startups, but also by OEMs. Uh, not all of them are already products, but we can see that there are already products on the market, as we could see uh, in, in the last, um, also in the last presentations. Um, and they work properly. And um, if we have a, a, a look um, in detail, we can see there are many projects are dealing with mechanical reading because of the high, um, high workload and, and the problems uh, when we want to avoid chemicals, uh, but also harvest. I have to look uh, in, in detail about the harvest projects. There we can see many projects are dealing, as we could see before, many projects are dealing with um, fruits and watch tables um, in some cases or in many cases uh, organic product uh, produced fruits and vegetables so uh, there are many challenges when we want to introduce autonomous vehicles and uh, i want to mention some of them of course the platform the powertrain energy management and something um, um, something uh, like that but of course, navigation, we have to detect where is the row for crop production, uh, for instance, uh, the path planning, the headland management, and so on, trafficability. But the, the process itself is the main issue and is the main challenge. What are the quality requirements? What, are the, what sensors do we need? How can we recognize the development of the plants or the fruits? And what are we doing if anything doesn't uh, work?
well, how to deal with fault management, with loss reduction and anything. anything more. And of course, uh, the operation issues, safety and security, obstacle detection, and so on, and so on, and so on. So as you can imagine, and as we can see, um, if we want to, um, uh, if we want to uh, operate processes autonomously, we need a lot of sensors. We need a lot of sensors in order to replace humans from the machine uh, and to make it, uh, uh, to, ma to, le to let it uh, operate properly. And the sensors are providing data, and that's the that's the main reason why we are now are very uh, looking forward to have uh, the technology of artificial intelligence because we can gain additional information besides the work, besides the process. We can uh, gain additional information about the process. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the 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 robot can uh, on the robot could, could be installed a further sensor which doesn't necessarily. Uh, be needed for the process itself, but could us provide uh, additional information. So some examples, um, uh, some of them uh, are already uh, been mentioned, detection of soil condi uh, condition and trafficability, not only related to moisture and rain or water, but also for slopes, for furrows, for ditches, for obstacles and so on. Uh, automized path planning is uh, path planning is, for instance, not only interesting for a robot but also for a manual driver itself. Uh, could be a suggestion uh, for how to to work in an optimized way. Collision avoidance we have mentioned, and the whole range of plant monitoring and plant treatment, uh, pest and disease recognition, uh, in order to make a very precise uh, management health monitoring. Um, and uh, to introduce decision uh, support systems, fertilization strategy and weed management are some special issues. And some, uh, some more are, would be machine logistics, uh, or, um, very important for service contractors. Um, I think the trend will be that the farmer doesn't own uh, the machine itself, but he uses services or he wants to rent a, a, a machine. Um, yes, harvest of organic fruits we have already seen with detections by drones, for instance, could be uh, very interesting because drones are very, um, uh, very cheap, uh, uh, got very cheap uh, recently, and uh, we have high technology could be used for uh, a few uh, between uh, the, the bottom and the satellite, anywhere uh, between there. So, um, two main areas will be uh, of main interest. The one uh, are vegetables, wine, and fruit. So, because of the high benefit, yeah. And the other thing are organic farming because of the limited possibilities we have there. So, those are areas where we will see many developments uh, now and in future. Some examples from our institute. Um, the mowing robot uh, is, is a project where we are uh, moment, uh, 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 currently are working on. So it is uh, a, a mowing robot which um, makes uh, a management of the grassland uh, into the row, uh, means between the trees, which is um, very, um, which is, uh, has, which is, has to be, which requires very much uh, workload and is time consuming, could be optimized. Another thing is the detection of row crops. Uh, the, uh, the, the crop rows are can be seen very clearly if uh, only the crop is on the field, but if uh, there are is uh, there is many uh, there are many weeds and everything is green, it is very difficult to see where is the row. But this is very important because the robot has to know where how, where he has to drive. Um, the further application are planned to detect to detect and uh, recognize plant and soil parameters. Um, on uh, CNN-based segmentation and object detection, uh, we can uh, we can uh, realize uh, the crop itself and to distinguish between the crop and uh, the weeds, but also uh, recognize other things uh, covering covering the soil and even the soil itself, the roughness of the soil, uh, for instance. Or maybe we can uh, in future we can have a better insight the soil. So, and another example we have worked last year it was uh, recognition of uh, the flowers of strawberries uh, for different um, uh, for different reasons uh, could be improve um, the 
system doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there is a robot, but uh, maybe a better system for improving the processes during uh, strawberry uh, production. So that is more or less uh, all from my side. Uh, I can all, I can only invite you if you are interested to have a, a scientific uh, combination company, uh, of your projects, to have a scientific a few on your projects, or uh, if you are interested to be uh, to to have us as a partner in uh, research and developing uh, projects, we are um, we are uh, very open to look forward to deep to dive in in that uh, new in that new uh, and very very interesting and very challenging uh, technological branches, and uh, we are. Uh, really um, looking forward to cooperating with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, overview, this panopticon on what's going on in AI, IoT, robotics, and agriculture. And uh, as Mr. Pankras said, please reach out to him and to his colleagues on our B2Match platform or use the contact details provided in his slides. We have received a couple of questions and let's take a look at them together. Um, Martin asks, are there any national or EU programs to support the application of AI in agriculture? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I suppose this is something you would be able to answer. Yeah, um, there is uh, the Digital Euro program uh, currently in preparation and will be valid, I think, during this year, uh, the first calls are open uh, concerning digital innovation hubs but there is another uh, program which uh, is open for so named test and experimentation facilities uh, in total different branches not only in agriculture but also for agri-food uh, the target is to install a um, consortium or a network of uh, testing and experimentation facilities for artificial intelligence and that, that is, of course, very interesting also for us um, because um, uh, we are able to do that. We have the innovation farm and we have the uh, knowledge uh, behind uh, in order to compare and accompany uh, new uh, companies, uh, small and medium enterprises or startups. Uh, and we have the knowledge also from uh, the, also the, the, the agricultural knowledge behind. So that is very important and we hope uh, we are part of that network. Great, wonderful. And also a hint, you might be able to find your project partners during the P2B meetings. So have a look at who's there. Um, and somebody asks, is AI, IoT and robotics also a topic for smaller farms like in a typical farm in Europe? We, yes. hear this, we, heard, we heard this question a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's, um, so is it a I... question of scale uh, that the return yeah. of investment is... Uh, Makes sense, yes, or of yes, of course, it's of course a very, very important question because uh, because of the uh, real of the of the fact that uh, uh, we have not only uh, very big big farms, uh, more than one thousand hectares uh, in Europe, and we have in Austria we have the average farm size is twenty hectares. Yes, you have to imagine twenty hectares. We have one hundred thirty far farmers in Austria, and with an average farm size of twenty hectares in Germany, fifty. Uh, in in um, in Canada, 500 uh, Eastern Europe. Um, yes. Um, so, if we don't succeed uh, to bring high sophisticated technology also into small a small structured farm uh, uh, sizes, we have really a problem. So that has to be our our uh, our real our target and uh, can be done due to several um, uh, measurements, yes. One is, yes, try to become cheap. Well, of course, if it is cheap, if the technology is cheap, um, it can be uh, bought by also a small farm. And a robot doesn't necessarily mean that it is a very big machine, as we could see before, yes. The machines can be very small, uh, electric uh, operated with uh, small sensors, but maybe a swarm, yeah, swarm technology. So there are many robots and that is uh, scalable uh, from small to big farms. The other one is, uh, of course, um, using services. So uh, traditional agriculture, there is a, a transition in traditional agriculture. In future, services will be um, taken into account much more than uh, in the past. 
So um, rent a robot, yes, and don't uh, don't buy the machine, buy or uh, 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 buy the service. So um, maybe we rent a service. Yes, we know that from the machine and so named uh, machine and ring or uh, 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 service providers. Um, that is, I think, a common uh, common uh, system, and we, it will be used much more in the future. So, and in this way, we can also reach small farms, and we can also make them uh, provide them uh, to to uh, uh, get an access to high technology for small, small farms. Mm -hmm. So, AgTech as a service lowering the entry barrier. Very interesting note that we end your presentation with here. Uh, we will share the presentation, of course, and this will also be recorded because we also get that question a lot. Thank you so much, Mr. Prankel. Um, we wish you some additional fruitful meetings and uh, a good day. Thank you for being Thank a part much. of our conference. Thank you very much. Have success. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, and we move right on and we ask ourselves the question, um, what is big tech uh, doing to feed the world to software? And with that, I'm very happy to welcome with me on stage on the topic of democratizing AI and machine learning for the agriculture industry, Mr. Anurag Gaur. He is principal program manager at Microsoft. Hello, welcome, Anurag. Um, can you hear us? Uh, hello, Matthias. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear? Can you hear me clearly? Loud and clearly, loud and clearly. And we are a little bit behind in schedule, and we look forward to your presentation. And let me just pull up your slides and hand over the stage to you. And uh, this is live, so use the opportunity to ask uh, Anurag some questions in the chat, and we will get to them after his presentation. So talk to you in a bit. Here are your slides. Thank you, Mazayas. you in a bit. Uh, good evening to all of you from uh, from India. Uh, uh, let me let me continue to build on what Mr. Prankel was talking to you about uh, 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 AI in agriculture. Uh, as a, a tech company, our focus is on how do we make uh, how do we get. Uh, AI and uh, machine learning capabilities in the hands of uh, as many people as can use them. So therefore, uh, democratizing AI, uh, as you saw in all the discussions till now, uh, there is a lot of application of te uh, technology, a lot of uh, uh, innovations happening. How do, we, how do we make it simpler for people to use AI and machine learning in the agriculture business? Uh, with that focus, um, as we started to work on solving for this uh, problem, uh, we looked at uh, the questions being asked uh, uh, by different types of people uh, in, in the business. Uh, on the consumer end, at the fork end, people are very interested in knowing uh, what's going in in the food that I'm buying. I want to buy organic. I want to buy direct from, from, uh, from farm. Is that possible? Uh, what is the impact of my purchase on the planet? And on the other hand, uh, uh, end of the spectrum, if you look at uh, look at the farm, the farmers, the growers, uh, and the input providers to them are worried about how do we do more with less? Uh, and there is a real challenge, as you've heard uh, through the data now, um, uh, population is increasing, agriculture uses, at least in the US, 80% of uh, fresh water. Um, uh, so how do we how do we uh, make sure that we uh, do more uh, uh, with less? These questions we see are answered. Uh, I mean, the pressure from from the grower side, the pressure from the consumer side is uh, at what we call the fabric of agriculture. Uh, uh, these are uh, the food processors, uh, the uh, the CPG organizations, retail organizations, and we uh, we want to help. These, uh, as an enterprise company, we want to make sure that we are helping them find the answers so that they can serve the farmers better, they can serve the growers better, uh, and they can serve uh, uh, the consumers better in giving them the right answers, perhaps coming out with sustainability scores on their uh, uh, on their food labels. Uh, so those kind of things we want to enable. So in, in now in doing the, in building such a platform, uh, there are obvious challenges uh, that 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 th these agri businesses face. Uh, 
getting all the data in in one place um, is a problem. And as we went the, uh, through our research uh, phase, as we talk to more and more uh, agriculture businesses, uh, uh, large CPG organizations, we figured out that they had islands of automation, islands of data where there were there are teams that are driving innovations and 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 uh, creating these ingestion pipes, and it was tough for them to maintain them. It was ending up creating uh, islands of data uh, on which there was a lot of uh, uh, of application of analytics. Uh, there were a lot of uh, applications uh, uh, that they were a lot of processing that they were doing on it uh, to get insights from it. Uh, but the power really is when you put all the agriculture, all possible agriculture data together. Uh, we also saw that data scientists and uh, uh, availability of these data scientists, uh, the ability to uh, attract and retain these data science uh, talents in an organization is challenging. Uh, as you would see, so much of fintech organization, uh, so, so much of ag tech uh, uh, organizations coming up, um, uh, uh, so many startups around agriculture, they're all looking to hire uh, and create their uh, differentiation in the market uh, of the data science uh, on the customer side. So how do you uh, how do you retain this talent? How do you uh, uh, get this talent? So and then pre-processing, uh, we saw, uh, we got an interesting comment from a large organization. Uh, these guys told us that, hey, look, 80% of the time, my expensive data science resources are doing data engineering. Uh, there is a lot of pre-processing and data engineering that is required uh, to fuse all of this data together. Um, satellite data could be of different um, uh, uh, resolution, um, different types of you know data coming from farm equipment, from sensors. All of that needs to be put together. Uh, interpolation services, etc. Uh, uh, removing the noise. Uh, there's a lot of pre-processing pre before you can get to. Uh, the stage of creating analytics ready data sets. Uh, so these are five things, uh, uh, five challenges that we saw that uh, that another way to look at it is that these are all uh, undifferentiated tasks. So uh, these are all tasks that uh, that uh, that uh, we saw organizations spending time in um, uh, not really creating uh, their own market differentiation, not only not just focusing on creating uh, AI or uh, ML models that could you know uh, make them stand out in the market, but these were taking time more on the infrastructure side, on the infra side. So we, uh, as a tech company, we 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 saw that as an area where we could help our customers. So therefore, to enable analytics, uh, what we uh, we focused on was number one, to build a geospatial and a temporal data store uh, on top of our core Azure platform. Uh, and then uh, have a common data model. We invested in building an agriculture-focused common data model uh, uh, through an acquisition of a company called ADRM that was uh, in late 2019. Uh, they specialized in building industry data models uh, for decades. Uh, they spent a lot of time in building a, a, a data model uh, for agriculture, dairy, uh, poultry, uh, uh, for us to use as a foundation layer uh, of uh, uh, of farm beats, our, our ag platform. Now, what this enables is that if you have historical data, if, if, if you've got islands of data, it just becomes that much easier to pull that data in into this um, uh, data mart and integrate that data. Uh, so that's number one. The second is uh, ingestion pipes uh, and building them and maintaining them. So we focused at building ingestion pipes for satellites, enterprise weather forecasting services, uh, soil related data. And we heard today earlier that, you know, uh, it's not just important to look at, uh, uh, you know, above the uh, farm or on the farm, but also data coming from uh, under the farm, from under the ground. Uh, so soil data, uh, uh, sensor data, sensors that are in the soil, sensors that are on the ground, um, farm equipment. Uh, so John Deere's uh, tractors or CNHIS tractors that are going into uh, the field, being able to get uh, tillage, harvesting, spraying data from that equipment. Data from drones. Uh, uh, Dr. Prank, uh, Mr. Prankel talked about drones being very cheap. Uh, everyone's flying them. 
Uh, what we've also realized is that uh, while drones are cheap, drone pilots are becoming very expensive now. Uh, and uh, uh, not only that is regulations in a lot of countries now because of uh, the um, the not so nice uh, uses of uh, of drones. So that plus data uh, around soil coming out from uh, or planters are that coming out from labs. Uh, 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 and the scouting apps and custom data. So we're we're building ingestion pipes uh, so that our customers don't have to um, waste their time in putting these ingestion pipes and maintaining these ingestion pipes. So data comes in into a geospatial temporal store that has a common data model, uh, 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 agri first common data model as uh, as the underlying layer uh, to store the data and build the interconnects. The second is uh, then to transform this data, pre-process this data so that we can have this data ready for you to do analysis at scale. You should be able to you know, uh, run queries like, um, you know, uh, give me a list of all my farms that have uh, uh, X farm health indices, let's say NDWI at this level, um, uh, has soil moisture at this level, has been tilled, um, uh, um, uh, uh, has not been harvested yet, has, has nitrogen at this level, uh, you should be able to, uh, you know, do this query across different sources in one time and see results uh, of all of that. Uh, that, we realized, was very expensive for people to do, uh, time-consuming for people to do, so the platform enables that. Um, and uh, finally, enabling analytics-ready data sets, ARDs, so that uh, you can normalize all of this data, clean up all of this data, complete all of this data, and take it into your machine learning workbench. So that's that's the the, the work that that we do to enable customers uh, and partners to build insights and recommendations. Now we are not uh, um, uh, we are not agronomy specialists. Uh, uh, we are just a technology company. Uh, while we've invested in data science, in uh, putting together base models uh, that customers can use as scaffolding to use uh, to build their own models. Uh, but our uh, intention is to have our partners uh, build models on top of uh, this framework. So we've seen uh, customers who've begun to use our uh, preview product, uh, building seed recommendation models, sowing dates, disease detection, disease risk models, harvesting, uh, windows, yield forecast models, these kind of models. Uh, so with with those three things done, uh, store, uh, ingestion pipelines, conversion into ARDs, uh, getting your data ready uh, for transport into your uh, machine learning uh, and AI uh, models. Now, that said, what does the uh, simple high-level architecture look like? Now, uh, if you uh, imagine on the left data sources, and this is not an exhaustive list, this is the list that uh, uh, is available mostly today. So if you're looking at satellite, Sentinel um, uh, 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 from European Space Agency is already added. We're working with Airbus to enable premium um, high resolution imagery in, as well as adding other free uh, agri resources uh, from um, uh, uh, ESA from NASA uh, and other locally uh, relevant ones, uh, weather forecasting service uh, from DTN and ClearAg. And again, uh, we don't want to limit customers to uh, what we've built. Extensibility is the core. Um, uh, 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 extensibility is the core uh, of our design. Um, so you can use the extensibility SDKs to add any uh, weather forecasting service, uh, uh, and uh, you can use um, uh, uh, the extensibility framework to add any sensor provider. Also, we've we're working with uh, Davis. We've made the connection. We're working with Pessel. Uh, you would have heard uh, uh, Dr. Pessel yesterday. Um, uh, so we've got sensors, uh, the sensor family from uh, from from them uh, will be available on uh, the platform. Uh, as well as sensors that uh, send data into the uh, Azure uh, uh, IoT hub. Uh, and again, you can use the uh, extensibility framework to add any uh, any sensor to the platform with, uh, with less than one day's work at your end. Uh, so once the data is in into uh, the geospatial temporal store, uh, uh, you can use the egress APIs to do three different things. 
uh, take the data into building your own uh, farmer facing retailer facing government facing apps uh, your your own saas apps you can take the rest full apis or use the connectors to build uh, your own dashboards either on, on our platform or any other platform that you want to build it on we prefer that you build it on power bi get more value for your investments in microsoft Uh, or use uh, um, use Jupyter notebooks to take the data to your machine learning workbench to Azure Synapse and hydrate your analytical models with your own data uh, and get insights. Uh, now that's an important point that I'm making there. The, to hydrate your own models, you could also benefit uh, 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 in using our uh, uh, our partner ecosystem. We are working right now, and keep in mind this is still an engineering product. Uh, um i am part of the azure engineering team we are working at this product so in in about a year's time when it's available in market we'll have a strong partner ecosystem uh we we did announce in november a strategic partnership with bear and climate uh um uh, so uh, our uh, just to use climate as an example our intention is to get uh, um uh, uh, you know for example yield forecast models or disease detection models from climate they've got agronomic Uh, 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 capabilities. Uh, they've uh, they've got strong agronomy focused data scientists who've been working for decade a decade plus in building these models to get these models uh, uh, with synthetic data on the Azure marketplace, so that you in, instead of hiring data scientists to build your own models, you could license these models, get these models into your instance of Farm Beats. um uh, and then uh hydrate it, uh, these models with your own data and get to insights faster so for us that's our vision to accelerate uh, um uh, your uh, uh, your journey to insights uh, from your own agriculture data so our focus uh, if if you imagine this slide as a layer cake our focus is to build the base agri stack give you the services of getting all your data together and realizing its true potential um uh Uh, as that data comes together uh, by using the data treatment uh, uh, processes that we put in place as well as the underlying common data model and then leverage uh, add-ons from uh, our partners or ourselves we've invested uh, um, in a few data science models that doesn't expect us to be uh, agronomists so sensor placement ma maps soil moisture maps uh, ndvi lai forecasting models uh, um a biomass model that we worked at with USDA that's available on GitHub uh, for people to use as scaffolding to build their own forecasting models all of that leading up to enabling customers like Lander Lakes uh, Lander Lakes was our uh, first customer that we started co-building with in our industry engineering teams we uh, look for co-building opportunities with domain experts because while we get technology uh, competency to the table we need to learn more uh, from domain experts so we like to build we co-build with uh, um, uh, uh, with domain experts so lander lakes was one such case uh, they've now uh, moved their uh, data repository to our base agriculture stack uh, that we call farm beats um, and uh, their uh, farmer facing apps their sustainability apps over time will start working off insights from this base ag stack uh, similarly for uh, climate the intention is to work with them to get uh, more in, uh, more capabilities more agronomy first models for uh, the larger ag food business uh, ag food industry um, uh, as well as uh, help them benefit from uh, focusing on creating differentiation uh, and on data science while we take care of the base uh, agri stack uh, for them too so Uh, likewise our intention is that uh, you know over the next year or so we'll have more such customers we that we co-build with before we uh, release this pro product to market uh, for us uh, the, this has been our journey uh, we we researched this industry for two years uh, ranveer chandra is a chief scientist who been working on agriculture for quite some time uh, we've had our Uh, you know uh, our first product and a lot of learning from that uh, then we went into a managed service we got feedback that we need to make it easy the experience of using the service easy for customers uh, we've had we are at about this stage where we've had strategic partnerships to again co-build with 
uh, ag specific ISVs. Uh, we hope to be available in public preview format, which is uh, uh, generally, uh, which is like available for most of farm beats, uh, most of uh, Azure customers before we get to general availability and the product has a price tag uh, uh, early next year. Till now, it's a, um, it's a research product. So, uh, that said, uh, 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 let me let me close this here. Uh, our intention is uh, uh, to help customers create differentiation, focus on um, uh, on what they can uh, do once all the data and uh, all the pre-processing is done for them, uh, and focus on AI ML so that they can create those models, create that innovation to differentiate. Uh, in the marketplace uh, and future-proof uh, uh, agriculture with AI ML because we do need to feed an increasingly large population while facing climate and other environmental challenges. So, uh, uh, thank you very much. I am Anurag Gaur. You can reach out to me at, your, at my mail or on Twitter or social media. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to take questions now. Thank you so much, Anurag, for this interesting and amazing presentation about all your initiatives and uh, your um, programs. We have received one question, and I'm sure our participants are right now scrambling to <laughs> type in more questions for you, but this is maybe one of the most essential ones anyway. Um, do you have open call to actions to AI solution providers or ag tech companies? How can they take part in your ecosystem and framework? That's a great question. Uh, and uh, see, in building this and as we be in private preview, in this stage that we are at of our IP, of our platform development, uh, we don't want, as an engineering team, we don't want to work with more than 20 odd customers. Um, uh, our focus is to get validation for what we are doing and in our larger co-build partnerships like with Land Lakes or Climate and Bear uh, is uh, to go deeper and, and understand, like we've understood how data works, uh, what are the interdependencies of different types of data coming in, how what's the relationships with each other and what insights can it unlock uh, with the work that we've done uh, 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 with Land Lakes. Uh, uh, we hope to learn a lot more uh, uh, with the work that we do with bear and climate. Uh, uh, so our focus is to learn so that we can identify patterns and make them available to uh, to everybody uh, in this industry uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a feature of a platform. That said, mm -hmm. in doing that, we also went to a few startups and uh, to validate. Uh, you know, I mean. Does our uh, building a data mart and ingestion pipes uh, and doing all the pre-processing, heavy lifting there, does it help them? And it turns out, yes, it does. Um, uh, so uh, there is an uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, ag tech startup uh, uh, that's taken a production dependence on us, even in this private preview stage uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. for our satellite pipes. And uh, now we'll work with them for the weather pipes. So, uh, so yes, uh, people do find value in what we're doing, uh, uh, but uh, right now at the current uh, development stage, uh, it, it's not an open call for all uh, startups to come uh, onto us. Uh, I think there is uh, 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 there is still a little bit more work that we need to do, uh, especially with our climate and uh, bear partnership. Uh, uh, to add more feature sets to make it much more richer uh, offering for uh, customers to use. We do want to help customers mm -hmm. to move away from the infrastructural things that they're doing right. uh, and mm -hmm. focus on, you know, on, on creating differentiation for them. So uh, long answer to a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you're thinking to yourself right now, well, I, I have, I really want to ask Anurag something. You can contact him actually uh, on our B2Match platform. And uh, we will, of course, share the slides um, that he will provide us with. And yes. to, to, to some couple of more questions. Yeah. Uh, what is M architecture for? And what is the importance of domain experts to start from the design phase to avoid failures of AI that happened a lot? Uh, interesting, interesting question. I'm seeing M architecture as uh, um, uh, as the data model, as the CDM, the common data model, uh, perhaps. 
uh, uh, perhaps that's that's how I'm trying to make meaning of that. For us, uh, common data model is quite important because uh, um, uh, uh, for us, uh, see, somebody somebody calls rain rainfall, uh, somebody calls rain pre precipitation, uh, uh, and in local languages it becomes more complicated. Uh, the interdependence between and you would have heard across, you know, how does uh, how does a camera make uh, uh, make sense of you know uh, um, what it's seeing? How do you store that information? And how do you build the interconnects with you know what what else can can that insi insight uh, can that uh, the for example in the Apple example uh, can the image uh, of uh, the Apple that tells me that enables that that company to do a score. Uh, can that also go into a yield forecasting model for me? Uh, can that go into some other analytical model for me? So for us, that CDM, therefore, the underlying architecture of how we store the data, how we organize all that data around a boundary so that uh, all those data units come together for that boundary for me to build analytics, uh, 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 machine learning, or uh, AI-based models on top of it. So CDM, uh, mm -hmm. common data model, is important. Domain experts are important because I cannot as I as a I can have the platform, but I can't tell you if with this change in humidity, wind direction, um, uh, is there a risk for a pest in in the potato crop? I I can't tell that as Microsoft. Mm -hmm. You won't believe me even if I tell you. Uh, I yeah. need domain experts uh, uh, to do that to have that credibility in this industry. I need domain experts right uh -huh. from the design phase so that I understand I build the platform right for for that uh, uh, specialist to use. Uh, it's a new method for us to do engineering. Uh, we want to be purpose built for an industry. Therefore, I need insights from the industry. Uh -huh. And that, right from that side comes our last question. And maybe just a really quick answer as we are behind time. Sure. Is FarmBits available for a subscription for farm owners or for evaluation to develop use cases? Uh, it's in private preview. Uh, uh, for farmers, uh, uh, short answer is yes, you can. Uh, you reach out to us and we can enable. It will take a lot of heavy lifting at your end at this stage right now. We don't recommend it for you, uh, uh, for, for growers, for farmers. Uh, we realize this quickly. Farmers and growers have a lot of challenges already. You don't want to spend time learning technology and APIs and building it on top of it. Uh, give us a few more months and uh, we'll have uh, uh, ready solutions by our partners that you can that you can use. Um, you could use Climate Field View that will be running on our platform soon. So I thank you so will. much, Anurag. And uh, really appreciate uh, you taking the time to be part of our uh, conference on Applied AI in AgTech. Best wishes and uh, hope to stay in touch. Wish you fruitful meetings and... Uh, Wish yeah. you all the best too. Um, I have a great evening and the rest of the conference. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. And we are moving from India to Italy, where we will say hi to uh, Davide Parisi. He is CEO of Ev Evja. I hope I pronounced that right. And let's see if we have a connection to Davide. Hello, can you hear us? Hi, hi. great. And you? <laughs> uh, yeah, very good, very good. And uh, you will be uh, talking to us today about AI for your data-driven architecture and yes. uh, data-driven uh, agriculture, I'm sorry. Without further ado, uh, I would hand over the stage to you and maybe just check for a minute if we already have your slides that you will uh, be yes. showing us. Um, ready? Yeah, and uh, this is a live event. So uh, during Davide's presentation, um, feel free to ask questions. We will be seeing each other again in the Q and A session. And for now, Davide, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you. I thank you for your introduction. 
and uh, I'm Davide from uh, Evia. Evia is Italian Dutch startup. Uh, we work in uh, agriculture market, specifically in horticulture market. And, uh, and today I want to show you how we can help the farmers thanks artificial intelligence that improve irrigation, nutrition, protection, and the yield prediction of crop. Okay, uh, today uh, we present our solution, uh, our IE solution uh, is a combination of uh, IoT technology. We collect the data from the sensors and we combine with uh, predictive model machine learning and artificial intelligence. In, uh, in these pictures, we have uh, the pictures of our system, uh, the device we install in open field and uh, greenhouse or vertical farms and the software and the big data platform to the collect to the data. Our, um, our company started uh, 2015, five years ago, and uh, we are working in Europe, South Africa, Bangladesh, and, and Mexico. Uh, our investor is RWE and Baiva and Startup Bootcamp, and we attend for the different horticulture events in all worlds. And we have the different projects in the different country uh, to develop and improve the predictive models uh, about the disease, irrigation, and the yield prediction. Our system works to analyze the data, sorry, but, and uh, we collect the data from the wireless sensors, we collect the microclimate condition of the plant, we collect the humidity, temperature, radiation solar, leaf witness, the BPD that we can correlate to the transpiration of the plant. In the end, the, is, is the plant work or not? Also, we collect the data of the soils. These raw data that we call, uh, uh, we send to the machine learning platform and, uh, and, um, and the predictive models. The machine learning take this data and suggest the good decision or the parameter is good for the farmers to take the decision on fields. Logically, you can check the all information for desktop, tablet and mobile phone. Our platform uh, um, is, the, is developed to precision irrigation. We have uh, the predictive models about the evapotranspiration and we can calculate the water needs for specific plant. For example, if the farmers work with lettuce, we have the model for the lettuce, for tomato, for every kind of a crop in horticulture market, in open field and greenhouse. The system work also with predictive protection. We have the disease predictive model of the machine learning and, uh, and the farmer take the right time and optimize the agrochemical or organic products and reduce the chemical residues or improve the quality of the crop. Also, we can understand the perfect nutrition when the plant is open to absorb the nutrition. And also we have the yield prediction models. The softwares um, um, can the real-time data analysis, the, the microclimate data statistic. Also, we have the agronomic models like uh, BPD, degree day, evapotranspiration, also the different prediction model that we use the artificial intelligence, yield, pest, disease, and the climate. Our device we install in uh, open fields because we need to data to the work more data for work uh, to work with the IE artificial intelligence and predictive models. Uh, our technology is sustainable. We don't need the energy with the solar panel to uh, for our device, and we monitoring from these sensors the different climate condition. The system is totally plug and play about the hardware side, you put on fields or in greenhouse, turn on, and the device collect the data and send it directly to the, our platform. 
We work more about the precision irrigation. We count every drop because every drop counts. We monitoring uh, the water needs. Also, the evapotranspiration models is connected to the machine learning. And also, we cross the transpiration rate, the time of irrigation, the volumetric water content from the sensors. The system logically is based for artificial intelligence. And when the farmers put the information in uh, our system, the machine learning take this, this operation on fields and uh, work to predict, for example, the water needs, to predict the good action about the crop. But especially, we use the machine learning about the prediction disease. For what reason? When we start uh, agriculture uh, markets, uh, many farmers or many companies use the statistic models or uh, or predictive models but uh, without machine learning in this case we have the two problem in uh, in agriculture in the nature the disease normally evolve for the biologic condition and uh, or for the climate condition and when we start many models that use the farmers don't um don't can update for the new climate condition or for a new disease infection because uh, normally the disease is possible to evolve for or because the farmers put more chemicals and develop the resistance or for example the disease is adapt to the new climate condition we use the machine learning to update the models how do you work we develop the models uh, for disease is uh, phytopathologic models we can develop the models for the develop condition to start the disease we send the double alert usually the risk of the infection and the alert that the farmers uh, see the disease on the plant but if we have the biologic evolution or our system don't send the alert to the farmers the farmers send the message to the platform to the high that don't receive the alert and the machine learning take this variation and update the models in the end we have the dynamic model thanks to the machine learning and we have the model that is more precious for the climate condition that work and the more feedback receive the machine learning more precious and more updating uh, the models in the futures also we use the machine learning for the yield prediction we develop the physiologic yield prediction is also in this case is not statistic models so we can uh, calibrate the models before to update online in the platforms and we calibrate for specific uh, kind of crop for example the specific kind for the different kind of the tomato also for the different kind of the leaf uh, vegetables and uh, when we have in also in this case like the disease the the different result of the models in this case the farmers send the message or signals in our platform there's is the model is not precious the machine learning take this variation about the, the models and update and uh, actualize the models for the different climate condition or for the different crop. Logically, the key uh, in uh, of success of success of uh, IE is uh, is a feedback that we can receive from uh, the field and also the, the past data that we have in the in the database. In this time, also, uh, we are developing the new microclimatic predictive models with uh, machine learning uh, that uh, connect the weather climate condition with the micro condition about the prediction for the prediction until five, seven, seven days before. And, uh, and, and, and thanks to our technology, the farmers they can take the good, in this case, decision our approach observe and uh, and collect the, uh, the data from uh, the sensors and iot uh, because to the training about uh, 
the machine learning, we need more data, more about the pro from the past. We use the machine learning and predictive models to develop and uh, new calibrate to the data models, improve and optimize your decision. Until now, our customers save until 40% of the waters, optimize the nutrition, improve the efficiency of agrochemical or organic product, and we have the good and accurate yield prediction models. I wanted to present today the specific case about the case Tomato Studio. In this case, we use the Peronospora model, the red spider mite model, the blossom and the butchery team models and the water management. The result of uh, this uh, business case or technical case, uh, in this case, uh, we start to the plant of March until August uh, that we have uh, the different harvest. And uh, we use the, in the two different case, we use the, the first case with the normally the farmers produce the tomato and in the second case we produce tomato thanks to the system is a tools but more with the suggest that we use uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence we work more about the waters and more about the disease in this case we use the machine learning predict model about the red spider mite models botrytis and more about the peronospora in this case, uh, we use, we reduce the 30% of the waters, the 20% of agrochemical for what reason? Because the farmers put the chemical or, or pesticide or organic product only when we have the specific climate condition and also we can follow the predictive models. And the more we have the good training predictive model in this case, the farmers send us the message when the models, for example, don't send the hullers and we improve the efficiency of the models. Logically, the training uh, during uh, one, two months from the, the start for uh, this specific case, but later the models work good and uh, we manage the crop, for example, well, only with suggestion or um, or we suggest or from the alert that send has the um, our system this is the typical example of our platform in the, you have the weather condition uh, because the system connected the gps position from field from our device and the system move from GPS condition. You have here the real time data like temperature, humidity, substrate data. Here we have uh, the agronomic models like uh, radiation zoom, degree day, and evapotranspiration models. And here we have the prediction models with the machine learning. In this case, about uh, the mildew or, or peronospora. Our, our models of machine learning work with the double alert. Here we have the alert of the risk of the infection. In specific case, when we don't look the disease of the plants and on calendar is very simple with semaphoro, red, yellow and green, the specific day that uh, you have the disease on the, on the plant. For what reason we develop these models, in this case, with the double alert, because this is a phytopathologic models, and uh, and you send the alert when is uh, is good for the manage your crop, because when you have the a disease of the plant is more late because you have the problem, but if the model send you seven days, six days before that you have disease. You can take the good action, like for example, treatment, or for example, if you say in harvest time, you can anticipate the harvest and you don't have the problem about the disease. One year later, two years later, it's possible the downy mildew uh, have the biologic evolution is adapt, uh, for example, uh, to the different climate condition and you don't receive the alert. 
When you don't receive the alert, you send the message from our, uh, to our platform and the platform update the models. Logically, we use uh, the machine learning uh, is only when um, uh, only when you have the biologic evolution, but more when we start in the different country under the different climate condition. For example, in a uh, specific case, we have uh, the customers in Greece and uh, we use the same model of the down mildew in south of Italy and Greece from the one two months, the downy mildew models don't send the one two alert for why reason because the down mildew or climate condition in Greece is different from Italy and thanks to the machine learning we can calibrate very fast the predictive models very fast in one month two months we can correct to uh, predictive models logically the platform send you the alert or here's or from email whatsapp and many other tools that you can use that we can use to send to the message this is the uh, uh, a dashboard from our system also we have the microclimate chart alert, alert and uh, real time the data you can compare the different chart for the different temperature or humidity solar or the different data and you can put the alert for the specific measurements also we have the calendar the calendar is important for operation on the fields because the farmers for example the check the risk of disease also the send to the message to the machine learning models but more can uh, appoint the simple note like for example irrigation treatments and the machine learning in this case take the treatments and uh, and the calculate for example the time of the new alert send you for the risk of the disease logically uh, our our product is a decision support system and uh, the last decision from the farmers but the machine learning in this case helped the farmers is it similar like the compass that uh, you can choose if uh, i can put the treatment today tomorrow or not also you can compare the microclimate condition for example in uh, in this case for the weather also you can compare for example with the soil condition and you can check this cross data to do choose uh, to choose the good time of the, the good moment about the irrigation we have the different scale for microclimate we have the scale about the micro the good microclimate condition the system suggests for example if you are start the a crop it's better that you say in this value is the combination is the WPD is the index that we use for the transpiration of the plant and the good cream climate condition when you start the crop in the microclimate condition is here when you stage in the middle of a crop is good here is green line and you have in the last for example in this case about the tomato when you have the flowers and fruits is better that you stay in this range that the system check also about the irrigation you can compare uh, the water needs machine learning predictive model the WPD transpiration rate and you can cross with the, uh, the data we can collect from soil for example uh, the volumetric water content electroconductivity and the, and the temperature our machine learning model cross the water needs the WPD the volumetric water content and suggest the good moment of the time of irrigation for what reason because it's good about to the plants uh, that we guarantee this condition the transpiration of the plant when the plant take the nutrients and the water from roots to leaf and uh, export from the storm the water and uh, this is the, the good condition for the crop and uh, and the plants and uh, we get um, and we help the farmers with machine learning models to guarantee this condition and when we don't have this condition the system don't suggest you to the put the water fertilizers and many other crop operation 
about the soil sensors and uh, irrigation, uh, our machine learning calibrate these sensors automatically from uh, algorithmic that check the different composition of soils. If uh, we work in soils, for example, if we have the clay soils, loam soil, or sand soils, when the farmers put the water, the platform understand the minimum and the, and the maximum level of field capacity and the permanent waiting points and suggest the minimum and the maximum level that you need for the good waters and the good ir irrigation. And so you can improve and you can put the good quantity of the water that you plant need in these specific times or specific phase of the crop. And this is the goal that we reach in our studio case of, um, of the tomato. I thank you for your attention. I prefer that uh, we have many minutes for the question and uh, answer. Yes, uh, thank, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. And yes. yeah, we, we received actually quite some questions from the audience. So let me put them online. Uh, yeah, best, I think, we okay. go through them one, <laughs> we one by one. have many questions. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. So yeah, okay. But, but, but which type of crops uh, do you support for yield predict prediction? In this moment, uh, tomato, lettuce, eggplant, uh, the mayor of, uh, of crop in horticulture market. But more in this moment, we have already from tomato, lettuce, vegetables, potato, and eggplant. Good. Then I would directly pick up the third question. Uh, yes. How long does it take to add new plants? Or, and how does the onboarding look like? Uh, so. I, uh, the second question is correct. Is how large are typical your customers? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, well, what, I, what I meant is this the third question, because in the first one, you, you just explained which type ah, of, okay. uh, where, for which plants you support real yield prediction. So the yes, third question yes. is how to add more plants and how difficult is it and how costly? Yes, if uh, we have the more plant, for example, or the different plants, uh, at the platform and we can put the microclimatic station and uh, for example, I have the tomato, lettuce and egg plant, the system check the the data is the same climate data and you can choose in our platform the tools of the calculation for example you can activate the yield prediction for tomato and the yield prediction send you the message for the calculation uh, from the data that we collect in specific condition and so you can choose the different yield prediction for the same microclimate data Example, in this case, I have in greenhouse the three kind and I can choose uh, the different yield prediction and the, and the system automatically calculate the yield prediction for the different crop. Perfect. The, so, okay. good, the question is... I, I now okay. marked the question. Yeah, yes, okay. How large or typical your customers? Okay, the good questions. Uh, now we work uh, with uh, small farmers uh, uh, until the big farmers. So we have the customers from one hectares until 1,000 hectares. Logically, the, uh, the change, the needs, and, uh, and the change uh, our, um, um, our needs because the uh, system works for the different large. But logically, for example, we have the different goal. Uh, more, for example, the big farmers have at a different uh, uh, yield or, um, or field in a different location is more interest, for example, about the yield prediction. The medium of farmers uh, is more interested to the nutrition, irrigation, and the, the, and the different, but also we work, uh, for example, more about the seed company, and with them we work, for example, the yield prediction about we test the a different uh, kind of the crop or for example when the company have the new variety but uh, the system is scalable we work for every kind of farmers okay thank you and this brings us to the last question from the audience 
Mr. Hus, ML with farmers observer data use that improve the model for all farmers. Okay. Uh, this is the technical question. This is depends about uh, when we work because uh, logically the big system takes a different climate condition, but uh, the goal is that we reach the precision predicting models and and logically is more um, is more precious for the specific area and uh, logically the improve when we have the different feedback from the different field but is more is learn more for specific area um, because it's more precious the feedback from the fields okay and so this so, so much for the questions from the audience. Maybe one question from my side. Uh, yeah. How does your pricing model work? Is it like by number of stations or is it by the utilized farm space or is it by the effect, by the additional yield that you uh, enable? How, for which model did you settle? Yes. Okay, our business model is a service. Uh, we use the rent model for device and uh, for each device, we cover in homogeneous climate condition until three hectare uh, in open field, two hectare in greenhouse. And our business models is correlated to the numbers of device. So if uh, we have, for example, 10 hectares, our business model is a rent for a three, three system is totally system, hardware solution, machine learning solution, and the software solution. And also we provide the guarantee insurance from device because in agriculture, we have some problem on fields, <laughs> tractor uh, or machinery. And uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we lost uh, in the last time, uh, no more device, uh, no many device, but uh, three for the tractor take is normally <laughs> and uh, or or for example uh, you can have the problem but our models work more about the point of monitoring more points more device and uh, improve the price of the cost logically we meet the customers before and we can check the good covers and uh, in our approach we start for example for one two three device and later we study the fields together the farmers and we extend the good covers from our system for all uh, all field is is actually uh, theft of devices a problem you know that people at midnight go to the field and they just harvest free components from from their devices no, no, in this moment is good. We don't have the many problem about the device because we uh, decide more rugged uh, for the different climate condition and also our achievement that we can work everywhere because uh, more work a lot more about the save energy about the device with the solar panels and uh, we can test many times before and uh, sometimes we can change uh, some sensors because uh, we are on fields and uh, we have the damage but uh, the minimum uh, um, working the device is two years until two years for this reason we choose the rent model because later two years or three years and the and the, we receive the good fe uh, feedback from the customers we can make the new contract and the new provide the new system for the same price yeah yeah, yeah. This, this, this totally makes sense because in a rent model, you can control which version the customer is using. This is otherwise yes. not possible. Yes. As, as everybody yes. of us knows that has dealt with Windows XP installations in the year 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yes. E e excellent. No, thanks a lot for the, for the insights. This is really, you covered a lot, lots of ground. I think you're also still available later for networking on the B2Match platform. Sorry, uh, I've, uh, I, I lost the connection uh, <laughs> in, uh, ah. in the uh, You can repeat. Okay. The Are you still available for networking on the P2Match platform? Yes, yes. Our platform is open. It is a big data platform. Of, for example, sometimes uh, we connect with uh, the management software of the farmers uh, and uh, we selected logically the data and uh, more depends 
of the size of the company because uh, if uh, we work with the medium company sometimes the customers ask us to the connect for example the uh, a task management platform so or the different platform we use the apa because uh, it's a big platform and we developed it for the microservices and we have the different servers and we can call from api for example in this moment we can integrate it uh, other iot device or sometimes uh, when the farmers have the sensors okay cool better for us we can connect with the api the a sensor proprietary from the farmers and we use this device uh, for, um, for our system we don't have the problem for this it's important that we have open api <laughs> It's good. Mm, yeah, def definitely. Great. So, yeah. Th thanks again for joining. And it was really a pleasure to, to listen to you. And yes, thank yeah. you too. It's my May pleasure. I wanted to prefer, uh, yes. I wanted to prefer uh, to focus the, is more practice that uh, do you, we use artificial intelligence in agriculture. And for why reason the, we use? We use more because we work in nature and we need to update and we follow the biologic evolution from the nature and for this reason we <laughs> use more artificial intelligence excellent so thanks a lot and yeah see thank you. you too and bye uh, bye and see you bye, bye. yeah ciao so so now comes from from italy to austria this is like now a very very small step geographically uh yeah, it's my special pleasure to announce uh, Mr. Andreas Prankel, the, the CEO of a company named FarmDoc. He will tell us here, uh, you know, how to turn fields into data. But it, it's also funny because me and Andreas, we, we used to be workmates in the in the same company because back then when the both of us were in management consulting and he, let's say, he, he left consulting a couple of years before me to set up a company. And this is now the first time that our path cross again because we're doing an event on agritech and he's an agritech company so welcome on the stage andy oh wait nope that's not that's the wrong andy that's the right andy hi <laughs> hi <Clemens. Hello. laughs> yeah we did some projects and it seems like um good now we can hear you no problem okay uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for the introduction. Uh, seems like we, we did some projects together in the past. Uh, seems like we uh, may do the one or another in the future as well. You see, all roads lead not to Rome but to a field and AI. So it seems I like see you, I see you already shared your slides. So let me put them on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, here we say I would hand over the stage to you. As usual, we take care of the questions in the background and see you later in the Q&A session. So see you later. engage. Yeah, thank you for the invitation um, and the introduction. Um, let's um, drop right in. Farmdig is a software as a service platform um, for agricultural production. So uh, we... Um, we service farmers, contractors, and the entire value chain of agricultural products um, with our services. Um, let me give you an overview of what we are doing. We serve um, at all management levels. So um, the most detailed one is um, the farm level itself. We provide an all-in-one farm management solution. Um, these are basic functionality plan planning functionalities for the farmers um, field management um, warehouse management all the stuff the farmer needs to run his uh, his farm and of course also precision farming technologies which enables uh, the farmer to increase yields and reduce the costs so optimize his own production process um, today it's very important that um, the farmer is no no island, no digital island. He is he should be able to um, work together with his uh, value chain, work together with the input provider, um, and also with um, his uh, purchaser, the purchase of his products in a digital way. So this is the second level, a network level. We provide collaboration tools where he can interact with his uh, business partners, and the third one is. Um, 
the strategic level, all these technologies we develop, we can also um, use for strategic purposes and um, yeah, provide a good basis for strategic, strategic decisions. Um, the special thing about what is Founder doing, since we are from a very operative level, or offering services from a very op operative level to strategic level, we can introduce um, um, an improvement circle. Let me start on the right-hand side. We integrated in our system different data sources. Very important, or even the most important, weather data, um, remote sensing data from satellites. Uh, we have integrated different um, APIs uh, from machine manufacturers, tractor platforms, and so on. And of course, um, the most important one, the farming data, the documentation of the farmer himself. We use all this data to um, create information out of it. We create models um, about the plant growth, about the farming itself, and um, provide this, um, the services, for example, a crop or field recognition service, uh, driving pattern analysis, um, biomass and yield estimations to the farmer to improve, or to the customer to improve their daily business. All our, our services should make it easier uh, for the um, uh, for our user um, to operate in the in the daily um, in the daily business, and due to high engagement, they provide more data, they create more data, which again um, makes it possible to improve our services, our algorithms, uh, and our products. And um, as we see here, uh, three bubbles. I um, brought some examples with me, how we do this. The first one, um, I think we heard similar um, uh, yesterday or today. Um, we estimate field contours um, by analyzing um, satellite data with machine learning based algorithm. We classify the border and after classifying the border, we, we do a, a subpixel refinement to make it look like more smooth and um, yeah, look nice. The benefit is um, that it enables the farmer to very easily create um, the master data, to set up the master data. Um, and not only um, set up the master data, but also sharing this data with his business partner, with his contractors. Um, he can for example, provide uh, the information to an agricultural contractor or another farmer. Where is the field uh, with a single click? And not also not only where is the field, but also how big is it? How is it formed? Um, and what is the um, um, the distance to the next field? So there are a lot of advantages um, of easy sharing data, but um, and we it's the basis for for optimizing the daily business and by making it so easy to set up the data to um, dive into the system, we lower the entry barrier of new users. And actually, that's our main task we have today. We need to, to smoothen the way for the farmers. They are uh, just starting with digitalization. And um, for a lot of them, uh, it might be well, it seems like a hard way to, uh, to do the onboarding on a new system, to change the daily processes and to adapt new tools. And this is the reason why we have to lower the entry barriers and make it, makes him, makes it, uh, make it uh, as easy as possible to use the services. Um, second example is our um, uh, GPS driving uh, pattern al analysis. This is one of our first algorithms we developed. And the target was um, to make the documentation of uh, field activities like um, seeding, fertilizing, uh, plant production, on, up to harvest, uh, more easy for the farmer or the operator of a tractor. What are we doing? Um, again, a mach machine learning algorithm um, processes the, uh, the driving pattern um, and recognizes to distinguish between, between working on a field and driving on the road. Um, usually, if it comes to automation of um, field records, of field recording or activity recording, 
um, companies use um, um, a point in polygon algorithm, uh, which is very error prone if you if you use, for example, a smartphone as a as a or smartphone GPS sensors. Um, it comes to um, false positive um, activity bookings, which we want to avoid. And and this uh, machine learning algorithm is much more stable. It recognizes um, field work, calculates the area, and again, this makes it possible to very easily set up master data, but also we can recognize um, cyclic patterns and identify um, the load pits. For example, when we bring manure to the field, this enables us to count the loads automatically and of course, we can also um, record or, or estimate the driving time on the road, road and uh, the working time on the field. So this is a lot of data which we can um, get out of the GPS data with a single start and a single stop um, interaction of the farmer, of the operator. Um, so this was, this was the target to not bother the user with um, putting data into our system, um, but providing them a simple interface. Um, and in the background, it's just rec recording and you get much more out of the data. Um, yeah. So that's the, um, that's the GPS uh, driving pattern analysis. Um, the nice thing is, the the closer you record the state uh, uh, when it happens so directly on the field the more accurate it is so a lot of farmers document the activities in the evening or when it rains days after it happened actually on the field and then we have to think about oh um what what did it do two days ago and how long did it take so a lot of, a lot of this information get lost and by recording it directly on the field it gets more accurate and we have a higher quality. A third example is, um, of course, we are calculating uh, from the satellite data, uh, we're calculating this uh, standard indices of um, NDVI, um, um, MSAVI2, um, RIP, um, which, yeah, NDVI well known as a bio biomass correlating index. The RAP uh, correlates with nitrogen um, and some other standard indices. But much more interesting is not this um, uh, this indices between zero and one, but getting real data of how much uh, forage, for example, is in this field on this square meter. And this um, we trained. Um, our algorithm based on satellite and weather data. Um, we uh, created a model uh, which can predict um, the, the, the growth of uh, grassland and uh, field forage. And we can estimate dry and fresh matter, uh, matter in uh, kilogram per square meter. So um, we can use this information, this metric information of dry and fresh matter to better adapt our input usage um, according to the target yield. So all, all the work we are doing on the field is um, because we want to have a certain target yield, um, which is uh, which the field is capable of delivering. And um, so we need not to use seeds when the soil don't need it. We don't. Uh, we, are, we need not to to bring. Um, fertilizers to the field if uh, the plant can't consume it. And this is what we want to um, provide a basis for what is actually my target yield. According to my target yield, what, do what does the, the plant actually need? And this we bring to the field and nothing else. Um, also, we can use this um, information um, to optimize um, from a logistic point of view. So if you think of um, a contractor having fields from from several farmers um, spread all over uh, the most fitly in low Austria or total low Austria, for example, um, then he can spend a lot of time by driving from one field to the other, or he can optimize his route 
um, by um, not only by where is the next field, but also um, how much did on this field grow and how much do I have to harvest? Um, how many how many um, transport vehicles do I have to bring to order to this field? And who can drive to the next field already and harvest this? All these questions we can support to answer or can we can optimize um, with this information how much does actually grow on the field. And very important and um, sometimes also underestimated, also the forage quality depends very much um, on this information. Um, how much yield actually did grow on the field and uh, I, I did mow because um, I can adapt then how, how often, how much activities and, and when do I do the, the activities and when do I harvest um, and bring home uh, my forage from the field into the, uh, yeah, to the farm. Um, and on this time or on this activities and the harvesting time, these are um, influencing factors on the forage quality. Yeah, um, this was a brief overview on what we are doing at FarmDoc and our main, of course, our, our main target group are the farmers and the contractors. But um, there is also, um, like I said, the whole process chain very interesting. We should use this technology, um, machine learning, um, AI tools, um, but the digital tools in general to collaborate, to work together and um, leverage all the optimization potential across the value chain. Yeah, that's basically my brief overview. Um, yeah. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. So wait, let me remove your presentation. Yes, here we are. We got two, two questions already. Also to the to the audience which are watching, please ask more questions. Uh, yeah, let me mark the first one. So it's also obviously for the audience which one we are talking about. So the first one is with so much data at your disposal. This is what you've shown, what you're recording. How do your customers react to suggestions for process optimization? Um, well, currently we, we um, integrate this, um, this tools directly in the, um, in the, in the usual way, man. I mean, I, I can, I can show actually, no, that's not possible at the moment. Um, we we um, we integrate this in the in the working process in FarmDoc and um, sometimes um, it's difficult because they even don't get really recognized. Um, some farmers really expect a lot, so they know, for example, they have an um, a feeling um, how much is the yield and. Um, they ask themselves, why does the system this not know? And, and so they expect a lot. So there is sometimes not that much surprise. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of um, processes like the field creation process where they really enjoy um, clicking around in the system and improve gathering data. So um, what we see in our engagement data is that um, every improvement step really increases the engagement. Um, so that's that's what we see in our data. This is a... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this means the, the customers like that you make suggestions they originally would not have thought of by themselves. Yeah, I mean, um, that's not a... We are not a consultant in, 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 in that sense. Um, we provide our data for consultants that they can consult um, the farmers. Um, so just, just just to be understood, right? What we what we use our tools ourselves is to improve um, existing processes. We don't change the processes of the of the farmers at the, in the first moment, but we uh, we just give them um, tools and possibilities to easier meet the target. So, and this okay. is, of course, um, 
yeah, they like it. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, I, I, I assume this answered the question uh, to, to the person because it was anonymous. If, if you have a follow-up question, be our guest. Uh, the next one is interesting uh, because this is something that we hear very often, you know, streaming from Austria, living in a relatively small country. Uh, mm -hmm. Is starting in a small country a blessing or a curse for a solution like yours? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I mean, on the one hand side, it's um, it's good to have a test market. You can have an overview. Um, and starting in Austria is kind of good because as home market, we, we know it very well. But in Austria, we have challenges because also the uh, the structure, the agricultural structure, farm, farming structure is very different. We have um, farmers who have a lot of mountains um, and more more um, meadows, more greenland. And we have farmers uh, with very intense um, uh, animals, keeping animals, and farmers um, working on the field, having no animals. So very different structures. Um, so this is on the one hand, on the one side, it is good to get all these uh, inputs of different requirements. On the other side, it's very challenging. And we have to take care, um, as everybody who starts very focused on, on a target group, to make this, um, um, this, this uh, very focused solutions uh, scalable to other countries. And um, out from a from a small country so it's uh it's so it's a difference if you have a, a big market like whole germany like france like uh the united states the basic market is very big and you get um from the beginning um yeah a bigger target group um so mm -hmm. as i said for the for the system itself it's good to get all these different requirements for the market um, side, uh, it's also very challenging to bring the, the system out of the small market um, to an international recognized tool. But I think we are doing well, well. We found our channels and our, um, our response. Um, yeah. Yeah, if I, if I may make a follow up, because there is not just the dimension of, you know, market customer requirements or size of the potential customers, uh, how difficult was it to convince people to fund to fund you to fund farm dog because i mean we we are also publishing the austrian ai landscape and i can say it's if you have a startup in the medical field med tech and so on this is this is very common in austria you have 20 plus startups in that area the same is true for manufacturing uh or, or fintech and text tech for example i think farm Agritech companies are still quite rare. So how difficult was it to convince? Uh, I think you started four or five, five years ago already to convince mm -hmm. back then investors to, to believe in the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, for making the first step, actually, it was um, from, from, yeah, if, if, I, if I have a look back, uh, I'm not sure if I would have answered this question the same way when you asked me five years ago. But um, if I see from today in the back, the beginning was um, quite easy. We had um, we had a, a challenge. We had basic funding, governmental funding, aid money, um, which was really good. There is a really good infrastructure in Austria of getting supported new technologies, AI, um, and just... Um, Try out new, um, yeah, new new ideas, um, and then it's the second step where you need some. You need money. You, re you really need a lot of money to make from this idea um, to a product, and also this first step um, was quite good. We got a good investor setup, but what's then very important, I think, is this uh, going international step, since um, developing tools like these tools, pre uh, we, uh, which were presented today um developing this for international um, customers um, for the world it really needs a lot of money and there we we slightly come out of the austrian investor scene probably um yeah if you see um, 
the, the, the amounts um, were invested into ag tech all over the world. Um, you see there is a, a wide interest uh, of, of investors um, putting money into, um, uh, into ag tech. Um, but you, you have to do this international step from a small market like Austria. And I think this is uh, for the Austrian ag tech team, this is a challenge we should work on getting visibility on international markets. That's why um, this is very close for me. So in international investors are interested in international markets. Yeah, no, thanks for this insight because this uh, pretty much is like the, the other side of the coin because uh, yesterday as a keynote speaker, we had Will Wells, who is also an investor in that area. And he showed the numbers floating around, which are gigantic at the moment. So Agritech nowadays is, is really a thing to invest in. But uh, obviously you, you need, if it's an international trend, you also need to be comparable on an international scale. So I fully understand that you need to exit Austria also in terms of uh, evaluations and so on. Yeah. Totally Great. Right, yeah. So with regard to time, let's say we pick up yeah, I think two more questions. The first one should be quite fast to answer. Uh, they say, great, you started from scratch. Why didn't you service existing tools in Austria? There are many to choose from. Um, existing tools, um, there are some, actually not, not that much. Um, we have a few tools in Austria. Um, there, there is a tradition. We have traditional tools from desktop farm management software and also some new tools and we did um, get in touch with them uh, we are kind of friends with some of them um, but uh, everybody has this let's say a little bit diff a little bit different history and um, to get on a very focused market like austria it's a very regional market so actually we are mm, good from another point we are the only system in austria who want to go international uh, who want to go outside of austria as well um, of course uh, fulfilling demands from austrian farmers but also going uh, to germany france uh, to europe and all over the world um, and this is not the focus of austrian existing um, farm management software and um, so there are some different interests with some, we are friends. With some, we have a kind of competition, uh, of course. Um, and through these different interests, um, there are com uh, collaboration um, talks, let's say. But uh, really putting our, our ideas into an existing system was difficult that time uh, when we started. Mm -hmm. We tried, actually, but... Um, so it's a, a very regional and conservative branch. So uh, we decided to build it up from scratch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This, this is a very interesting parallel to the field of tax technology, you know, automated invoice processing and so on, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. where you also have a company there, the, the previous name was Abacus, now they are called Finmatics. And they also said they develop a product for Europe versus in most European countries, you have tax uh, tools which are specialized on the respective uh, legislation in tax. So they cannot scale by, by definition to other markets. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it's interesting that the AI layer, coming from the AI side, you have an easier time to internationalize. Great. So dot, 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 dot. here, how precise are your predictions, e.g. for the yield per square meter and, and so on? So. Um, let me think. Um, do I have figures for this? Give me a second. Maybe we can um, switch it and take another first. And um, I have a few okay. seconds to have a look if you have some data about this. Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay, cool. <laughs> this is from the person that was asking with the pre-existing tools. Perhaps if you read it, it's easier to understand. <laughs> yes, that's true. Coding uh, local regulations, um, only local regulations would be, uh, would make it quite faster to go to other markets. 
since they are kind of required. Um, what we are um, recognizing in international markets uh, right now in terms of local regulations is that farm management system systems and we in the meantime as well avoid a little bit to go in too deep into uh, local regulations. Uh, when we look at the German market, for example, um, they are in a kind of a transition phase. Um, they got a new fertilization uh, regulation um, and um, they, they changed it every half a year since 2018. So even you are even local um, farm management software in Germany doesn't adapt to the new uh, legal regulations because um, law is changing too fast at the moment. Maybe it stabilizes again. I hope it does. Um, but at the moment for um, for farm management system, it's very difficult to go into let's say go into detail um, and adapt to local regulations. But um, um, you're right. Um, it would be nice if you just have to adapt to one um, one country and and grow faster. In this case, so um, let me have a look at this. Do you do you have to figure by hand? Because because if not, you could also write it later in the P2Match chat on the event stage. Mm -hmm. then, yeah, I, can see I don't our have next it. Speaker is already waiting. Yeah, okay. Well, then I don't want to. Yeah, but I, I would I would have the numbers right now the, the not in terms of kilogram per hectare. Um, but the, the Pearson correlation to the ground truth is uh, 0 0.89. And the error is um, 0 0.15 um, for fresh matter and 0 0.004 for dry matter. So it's quite accurate, um, but I, yeah, that's the numbers I can put right from the shelf. This, this reminds me of the old saying from Stephen Hawking. If you put the formula in a book, it is halving its sale. So I think you just halved our viewership numbers with this scientific explanation. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can, we can, we can in a, in a later in the, in the chat. Um, going too deep in this. Yeah. No, anyway, thanks a lot. And also, yeah, since, since you asked me before how the bit to match works and how to log in, I strongly assume you will be later on available also for networking. So also thanks for that. Yes, I will. And yeah. So see you, see you soon and, and have a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day as well. See you soon. Bye. So now comes my co-moderator on the stage. And so this is the, the penultimate session of this conference. So Johannes, tell us what, what's next. Well, well, actually, uh, I feel like it's pretty cool that we're now, as we are getting closer and closer to the uh, content end of, of today's conference, we're once again picking up um, real applications of of AI, especially when it comes to the area of autonomous driving. Will, our keynote uh, keynote speaker in the very beginning spoke about it. I wanna say uh, Daria also spoke about it from Kubota. So it's, it's gonna be very interesting and I'm looking forward to Ilya from Russia, uh, sharing a little bit more about what Cognitive Pilot is doing in, in that area and uh, how we can automate driving on fields and therefore uh with no further ado Ilya, thank you so much for joining us and looking forward to the presentation thank you guys i am happy to share my presentation today about uh, autonomous vehicles which appeared in agriculture world uh, the first slide would be about traditional farming yeah do you know you have a machinery and people yeah, uh, it's easiest way, but it's costly. And uh, the next step in the world was uh, um, precision farming. 
uh, everyone now, uh, precision farming is preloaded map. And with this, this is, uh, according to this map, you can move your agriculture equipment like attractors or harvesters and uh, do right borders. Uh, uh, it's a common technology. A lot of companies build that. Uh, but uh, it's not so interesting for people because we uh, we approach uh, uh, accuracy by a few centimeters. It's more than enough for modern agriculture world. Uh, the second, uh, the third stage, it's coordination coordination work. Uh, what does it mean? Means uh, it uh, at first it's coordination between uh, two or more harvesters or maybe tractors, which work together during the harvesting period. Uh, second kind of coordination is coordination between harvesters and uh, lorries or tractors which relo uh, reloaded uh, grain during the harvest period. Yeah, And this coordination is very important because you, you manage a few items as one. A uh, very interesting idea appeared a few years a few years ago when the uh, first harvester or first tractor in the row uh, can manage could manage by people uh, by uh, operator and other tractors in in the row uh, move uh, be behind that and uh, in this situation we can uh, dramatically decrease labor cost for harvesting. For, for agriculture, but it's not in interest of uh, it's out of interest our company because we are on the next stage. What is the next stage? Real time time automation farming. Uh, the first question usually it's why why we? Our company was established more than twenty five years ago, and all this all this period we have been working uh, for cognitive technologies uh, technical vision uh, and uh, we work with uh, hewlett packard we work with hyundai mobility uh, built uh, uh, autonomous drive uh, cognitive systems for cars and uh, have a good experience in uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning which uh, help us recognize all kind of um, obstacles uh, in, on the road. As a result, two years ago, uh, we built an um, agro pilot, uh, which based on this algorithm, cognitive al algorithm. And as a result, uh, this system was a pioneer in, the, in, the se in that sector. And in reality, we, we are the first company in the world which can create fully a real-time autonomous farming, uh, autonomous harvester. And uh, last summer, we have shown uh, autonomous tractors which work, which have, had been working uh, for a few days during the agriculture exhibition. Fully autonomous tractor without uh, without driver. Um, on the next step, uh, we're going to the supervising farming. What does it mean? We can replace a tractor or harvester operator from cabin. Uh, of course, it's uh, a hard task for our lawyers because we need um, permission from governments for for different countries uh, to create that. Uh, but it's uh, create a good possibility for a company which produce uh, harvesting uh, any kind of machinery, agriculture machinery equipment because it's reduced costs yeah for farmers or for agriculture companies it's create a huge possibility because all robots work as a good worker yeah in reality uh, our first robots working or uh, was working were working at, uh, on level as a highly skilled uh, harvest uh, harvester driver harvest driver yeah and supervising farming create possibility to uh, control um, uh, a, st a stage of uh, harvester or tractor during the whole period of seeding, harvesting, watering, loaning, or watering, or something like that. 
the next stage, it could be fully unmanned farming. It means that the, we, we have removed operator from the computer and all of uh, kind of operation and farm would be fully automatized automatized i think it's a long way uh it's not about tomorrow or past tomorrow uh but it's a final point of our traction is uh, fully unmanned systems which will work uh, uh with highly high level of accuracy uh without uh, exhausting uh, and it could be a huge economy uh, in, sp in the spending of agriculture sector and can in dr dramatically improve utility rate of agriculture equipment uh, if you have any questions or want to contact with me uh, it's my uh, LinkedIn link and uh, at last, I would like to show you what does it mean, how it looks, uh, um, uh, how, oops. excuse me. Oh, no. Uh, do you need the technical support? Yeah, I can't stop presentation. <laughs> <laughs> ah no, I can. Oh, thank you very much. It, re remove yeah. this, you know, magic yeah. hands. But if you want to show something additional, you can yeah, I would like this. to show it. In reality, it's uh, not about uh, pictures; it's a uh, reality. Uh, our robots looks like um, uh, not so huge. It's like an um, iPad or something like that. Like uh, it's like a monitor, uh, which uh, in this box uh, inside. We have a full system uh, with cognitive um, uh, for cognitive recognition, uh, which can work with technical vision, and as a result uh, can help uh, for machinery operator uh, keep row uh, control speed and even work with speed. We can manage speed of harvester, uh, depend of kind of crops, depend of. Uh, crops quality yeah and uh, as a result the big uh, task hard task uh, which we dis which we solve for a long period uh, now in this small box <laughs> like a additional screen in harvester tractor and or you can move it from harvester to tractor and back and use same um, block in different kind of uh, agricultural machinery which you, which you have. Excellent. So, yeah, before we before we take the questions from the audience, uh, I have actually a personal question because I, I we we see in many other areas where we are dealing with autonomous navigation, like mm -hmm. cars or like buses or even like drones. That, that regulation is always a very big topic. So for cars, yeah. you need a dedicated test track and the engineer sit, needs to sit in the car. I know yeah. from Austria that it was very difficult and it took many, many years until drones were allowed to fly over, let's say, a, a field or over a piece of, or, or a forest because, mm -hmm. you know, it, the, the drone might crash and hit someone on the head and, and so on. How this, is this with, uh, the, with your technology? Yeah, it's, it's our most powerful position in the, in the world because uh, the system of parallel driving can manage any obstacles because they work with preloaded uh, map. Uh, we have information, we get information from cameras and as a result, our system can recognize what kind of obstacle is, is it? Is it people or is it a uh, part of rocks? Or maybe it's other agriculture techniques which uh, work with uh, autonomous tractors or autonomous harvesters during the same period. As a result, we can prevent any kind of collisions. 
and uh, we are talking about that with uh, insurance company in the United States, and they can reduce in, even even can reduce uh, the payment of insurance if the harvester or tractor have this system. It's like a now it's look like a, a copilot, a system which can mm-hmm. help uh, uh, drivers to work safety and more precisely. But on the next step, it would be full autonomous driving just uh, by reload uh, software. Because hardware, our hardware are ready for that. We're just waiting for approval or permit from uh, from governments. Depend of country, of course. Mm-hmm. So, so can I imagine that this is a edge, edge AI solution, but with over the air updates? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, interesting. So let me see. Yeah, I see my co-host is also here. That's always good. Hi, Matthias. Hello, Clemens, and hello, Ilya. Thank hello. you for the amazing presentation. Uh, and really appreciate that you uh, take the time to join us in our conference. Thank you, Matthias. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think uh, all people are quite exhausting for uh, two, de- for two days. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And definitely those who uh, joined all the time, but we have some cherry pickers who only pick the parts that are really interesting to them. So, and it, it will be provided on demand afterwards. So uh, mm-hmm. this is really the trove of information on AI in, in agriculture. Mm, yeah, we, we will also provide a write-up of the event, which we will not write, we will just provide, but you know, no, you no, get the point it's, because it's... No. Now it's recorded, Clemens. Now you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's 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 just it's it, it it's a lot of ground we we covered. I think in total it was more than ten hours content, and we had zero breaks in between. So <laughs> it's really mm-hmm. ten full hours. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's it's, it's very it's, it's it's great that you joined. It's also yeah, it's also a, a topic I'm especially interested in in autonomous navigations because I spent a very long time in in the automotive industry in in Asia. Mm-hmm. And it was autonomous navigation that more or less kicked off the interest in AI in the first place. You know, the, yeah. the Google self-driving car that looked like an egg that was in 2014. This was like for, at, at least in Japan, this was like the headline news. And now you see it coming in the field first because yeah. you see this. You can some see years that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even you can, you can use that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, our solution not so expensive as uh, autonomous in autonomous vehicles in autonomous cars because, uh, as I know, in a Ford for Ford autonomous system costs quite more than forty thousand dollars, and our solution it's less than fifteen thousand. Excellent. And we Great. have one one thousand installation in Russia, in Kazakhstan, in other countries, in the United States, in Canada, even in Austria. We have one client from Austria. Yeah, and for us, it's it was very interesting because it was the highly interested, it, this client was highly interested of this solution. Yeah, because it's the future. Uh, in case of labor cost, even labor quality, in farm in, in uh, unfortunately now harvester is a huge machine very expensive uh, cost like uh, is comparable with ha- half million euros yeah and manage it it's uh, like a like an airplane <laughs> <laughs> like a black box yeah. and co-pilot yeah co-pilot uh, yeah <laughs> Are, are you uh, later on still available on the B2Match platform for, for networking? Yeah, sure, sure. Because I could imagine that many companies would be interested in becoming mm-hmm. a, a, a partner or, or how to become a partner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, yeah. Excellent. Awesome. So check out the B2B meetings and get in touch with Ilya Thank directly you. on our meetings yeah. platform. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Best Thank wishes. You. Thank you. Thank you. And wish you a nice day. Yeah, sure. See you. Bye. 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 So before before going to the next session, we are now like for the first time ever ahead of time, five minutes. So 
Yeah, we, we, we will play yeah. a, a brief video until the, the, the last speaker of today uh, will, will join us. So see you in around five minutes. See you in a second. So, and we are back from our first break ever at the AIC Agritech. So, with me on the stage, yeah, of course, my co-host Matthias, and last but not least, the last regular session of today, uh, we welcome back uh, Yasmin from the uh, AWS AI Marketplace. You Hi. met, yeah, you saw Yasmin yesterday already, plus the two companies which we are presenting and the Ah, oh, that's a nice special effect. <laughs> and the, the the motivation for the session today is yeah to provide an overview. How did it go? What are the yeah? How did it go for the both the companies and the AI service providers? So Yasmin, without further ado, the stage is yours. And yeah, see you later in the in the wrap up. All right. Um, thank you, Clemens. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Happy to be back. Um, some of you might have um, yeah taken part of my session uh, yesterday where I welcomed Pestle Instruments and Peshak Autonomous Systems, um, two family-owned traditional companies in Austria that were looking for, um, for AI solution providers. And um, just to wrap it up, so my name is Yasmin Morazadeh. I am the program manager of the AI Marketplace Austria. And um, we do challenges like this. Um, we do that with Clemens together and Matthias at the Applied AI Conference, but we also do that on our, our platform. Um, I only have one um, screen today, so that is why I am hesitant to share one because then I can't see anything. <laughs> um, but anyways, 
I just wanted to say that um, I just wanted to wrap up. How did it go? Because yesterday the two companies did present their challenges, and um, I did receive I did receive some feedback from Peshak. I did not receive any feedback from Pestle Instruments. Unfortunately, I couldn't reach them. But um, it's just for you all, like participants and view viewers today, that you get an idea of a call for cooperation. So a company presents their challenge and they're looking for a solution and then they have meetings. And I just wanted to let you know, did it, did it uh, go well? Um, was it successful? And would they recommend it to other companies? So um, Mr. Peshak told me that he had six meetings yesterday and uh, there, uh, there are three follow-up meetings planned so he thinks that there is a 50 percent chance that he found the solution uh, to his problem so um, he said that he has to um, make sure to check all the meetings like to follow up and to check if you know uh, if, if that was the right solution or not um, but he says that the quality of the participants was very, very good and also the quality of uh, the event uh, yesterday and today. So congratulations to um, Clemens and Matthias. Um, but yeah, he said that there are so many participants that it is a little difficult to find the right solution. Um, so as we know, we had more than 500 participants, so this is quite right. I know that both of them were fully booked, so um, both of them had um, the maximum amount of meetings um, possible for them. And um, he would definitely recommend um, the call for cooperation for any company that is looking for the right AI solution. So um, I will keep it short and simple since I only have one feedback for today. I'm really sorry for that. But um, I just, I'm just going to make this last call. And uh, if you are interested in um, doing a call for cooperation to find the right uh, solution for your digitalization AI problem, um, get in touch with me. Um, you have my name written down here. And you can add me on LinkedIn or send me a message. And we'll make sure to, um, yeah to help you with that and to support you to find the right solution. So um, I guess I'm the last part today. So there are already a few viewers, I guess, but um, I will, I kept it short and now we can wrap it up. The, the hardcore is still watching uh, or those that passed out in front of their monitor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same, those that fell asleep on the keyboard. <laughs> so uh, to, to those of you watching right now, uh, thanks for sticking with us. We uh, will put out the videos on demand later on so you can re-watch what will most interested you and uh, are happy to count you as part of our community. Yeah, you you deserved like the you know the, the gold trophy for AAIC <laughs> sitting exactly. yeah. endurance. We'll see you, Clemens. Um, though I'm not sure if that's on purpose. <laughs> oh yeah, we that's we can see Clemens, although he's a little bit pixelated. Oh, but, we can. Okay, so it's only my screen. I can only see him a black. Ah, screen. this is this is just a gray hair gray hair filter. Don't worry, <laughs> it's, okay. it's 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 a feature. No, th and thanks a lot for joining with the call for cooperation and also providing the feedback because uh, yeah, upfront it's always very difficult to know if this type of setting works for the respective, ver respective vertical. We had this last time, for example, with RHI Magnesita and I remember the guy, Mr. Fröhlich, he was flooded with meetings. And it's good to know that in Agritech, this is now also working very, very, very nice. So I look forward to the next events plural, where we have yeah, the, a similar setting with call for cooperation. And of course, for us as organizers, it's perfect. You have satisfied viewers, satisfied uh, corporates, and we have nothing to do. We just press the on button. You know, this is like autopilot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me be a part of it again. Great. Thank you. Then, yeah. We, we wish you a, a, a nice day. I'm, I'm pretty sure you will still be around on B2Match for further networking. 
Yes. And yeah, then uh, arigato gozaimasu in Japanese. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> so let's conclude this session and me and Matthias will provide a brief overview of yeah, where to find which information and which events come next. So thank you, Yasmin. And Thanks, see you. guys. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, Clemens. So now comes the most difficult part, sharing the own screen without the computer crashing. So <laughs> let's see if this works now with your screen. It yeah, works. we mentioned and this. Great. What? We, we mentioned this a couple of times during the event, but uh, so far in the last four years, the channel we most of the time use to announce new events, or also put later on the videos uh, yeah, or to do any event related news and announcements, this is always directly on LinkedIn. So we don't have a separate web page because we found out it's far easier to loop people in if you post it online. Uh, where LinkedIn is not the perfect solution is when it comes to videos. Those of you that have joined via the LinkedIn live stream will have uh, noticed that after four hours in a live stream, there's a cutoff. So this is why starting from this time, we now also stream everything on, on YouTube. And once the event is over, we will provide the individual videos here. This, yeah, of, of course, we, we have to reconfirm with the speakers from the last two days if, if this is okay with them or if, if we should black out or pixelate some, some, let's say, some things that were shown. But in general, this is the way to go. And each of us will also see the, the coordinates. Uh, when it comes to new events, we mentioned this yesterday in the opening briefly, but if you have ideas for new topics, just approach us. This is also how this event came, came into existence. We discussed this, I think, in, in November, and now two weeks later, we have an event with an international one with 500 people. So, yeah, if the, if the topic fits, let, let's, let's just do it. Uh, let's shoot us an email or, or yeah, write us on, on, on LinkedIn. Yeah, and anything. So, which which of the fifty things I forgot to mention you want to pick up, Matthias? Um, maybe maybe I want to have another look at the chat uh, in case anybody. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you. We are at the end of our conference, and a lot to wrap up, a lot of information to process. Um, our upcoming next event, maybe you have the slides on that as well, but we will delve into the topic of energy and power grids. I think we can already mention that. Yep, yes. here we go. For here we go. Yeah, this March one, we... 23, <laughs> we have <laughs> AIC on energy coming up. And of course, like... our main conference, uh, the large event uh, coming up in the end of May, uh, May 24th and 25th, uh, which is going to be hybrid. So we are going to be meeting in Vienna and in other places around the world, maybe near to you, and of course online, for those of you who can't make it. Perfect. So yeah, with this, let's, let, let's close today's session. And yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for watching it, for yeah, for tuning in, and also for those of you which now rewatch the event. Thanks for joining us on YouTube or LinkedIn, and we're looking forward to see you at the next event. So have a nice day and happy farming. Bye bye.